I got it. I got it. We still got this messed up background. <laughs> if anybody can do a screen share with me and show me where the virtual background is, Zoom has gone. We need a producer. <laughs> Ridiculous it is. I hate things. I, I hate it when things just disappear. It's like they, they was always there, and now it's gone. Oh, where's it gone? Oh well. Anyway. Oh, good. Anyway, what number of episode are we? Oh my god, good question. Fifth. 57 i know is it 57 i believe let me double check should know this right off the top of the head but i don't well i'm finally i think i'm past the rona past the yeah yeah you're looking uh, a bit perky mind you uh, way better perky. way better back in the gym energy's back yeah, you still gain, look pale. Yeah, but gaining the weight back and shit. I'm definitely on the uh, the recovery. Holy crap! We got a lot of comments on the last one. I didn't even notice. I didn't think yeah, we would. There's about thirty odd comments. Oh wow! So this is episode fifty seven we're recording right now. Fifty seven, yeah. And the last the last episode, like we said, a lawyer was a uh, rambling kazoo. It was. I want to um, point out it was supposed to be thirty minutes, folks, because I was sick. <laughs> It was two hours. Was two I can't hours. believe. We, and I, I even cut we some out. <laughs> I know. I can't believe we went for two hours, to be honest. I didn't think it was that long. Me neither. And I, I'm going to tell you, I crashed hard after that. I did because yeah. I was so sick. Oh, my God. Anyway. it was Yeah, lots of people uh, commented on it, though. And yeah, that, that I, show, I, I was surprised because since, like, my bout of the Rona, and then we had a bit of a break, and we wasn't posting regularly, um, our viewings dropped down a bit. They dropped to about sort of two, three-ish. But this um, is pretty this, good. Yeah, this is back up around the five mark. Yeah, and lots of... Okay, guys, I feel bad because I after I came back from being sick and off... Oh, man, I missed all these comments. I should have been in listen, here. People, Scott doesn't give a shit about you. Hey, I'm there. Listen. Back, Backstreet Karate's there. Commenting, liking, true. This is true. Loving. This is true. Terry's definitely the better of us. Um in terms of that, absolutely. Uh, but I am off work next week. They're making me take a week oh. off. Uh, so I'm going to get caught up on all kinds of stuff. But holy, I think that there's all kinds of, oh, yeah, I see some. We got to answer one question. What's, what's going on with BKK and IFK? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Well, uh, actually. Uh, <laughs> Terry Burke at the Kilkshin, Mike Tyson. <laughs> I'll take that. I'll yeah. take that. Um, Curse. <laughs> right, folks. We do have. Shanky. Are you listening? Yes, I am. I'm just looking don't at read all, amazing Don't comments. read the comments now. Okay. Okay. We have Shan Cameron in the waiting room about yep. to come in because we've got Shan Cameron on tonight on the show. Um, we have had a bit of a faux par with timings or something. So yeah, we messed uh, up the we uh, yeah up we the messed up the timings. Calendar. So we are waiting for him, but it's actually an hour earlier than we thought it was there. Yeah. So he's just getting himself sorted now, and then he'll be on. That's um, all good. But we we will just have a, a catch-up of the stuff that's been going on. As you just intimated to it, there's been a bit of an upset in the in the balance of the force. Yeah, I'm going to try to stay as neutral as I can, because as everyone is aware, I, I am a member of the IFK. Um, so I'm going to try to stay as neutral as possible. Uh, so I'll leave more Terry to make any comments on this. But yeah, there's been... I mean, there's, there was rumblings before. So since Hanchi uh, Arneel uh, passed away, rest in peace, um, obviously uh, things changed within the IFK. Uh, Shion David uh, took over as uh, the leadership of the president, IFK yeah. president. Um, and, 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 this, that, and, and I'll be, I'll be fair to Shion David. Mm -hmm. I, he's nonstop. I only ever see him doing stuff. Oh yeah, and even see him representing the IFK, flying here, flying there, doing stuff. It's like it's his full time job, just doing the 100%, IFK. Hundred percent, hundred percent, yeah, hundred percent. I would not question that at all. Hundred percent. Um, um, but any any event, there are inner workings and politics that happen in these organizations, especially when you know when a, when a leader passes on or passes mm. over the it's organization. It's inevitable. It's, it's inevitable. inevitable. It's happened. Really? Like we know this, it's not just in karate. It happens every, it happens in my work for God's sakes, let alone mm. in karate. So it did happen. Um, I, it's been a, 
But it's been, oh, I mean, we're not, this show is not about that. No. I just wanted to bring it up because uh, there's been no, comments. It's big news. And there's, been, yeah. there's been posts going back and forth. You and there. I mean, I'm, I'm new. I haven't got a horse in this race. Me I'm too. Not in the I, IFK. As well as I do, you are, I'm in the IFK I real. Oh, she on uh, Cameron is in her waiting room, but I'll... I've got no, I'm not in any of it. Um, I'm just a, an onlooker in. And I, I look at it this way. If, if obviously, if people want to go off and do their own thing, I encourage that. I, I, you know, that's my way. Go and, go and make your own way, the Ronin way. Do your own thing. But I'm, I also look at it both sides. So if you've got a new leadership structure there, and the leadership structure wants to go a certain way, um, then that's up to them and all power to them. Mm -hmm. If other people then decide, well, actually, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to follow this. I want to do this way or that way. Then they go off and do their thing. To me, that's evolution. Yeah. That's you, you had one, you had one thing that had been the same for decades. Um, uh, and you know, it, it was the same for decades. And, and from what I heard, it was a little getting a little bit stuffy, not a lot happening within the BKK, not the IFK. Um, yeah, they're very intertwined. Yeah. So now there's a little part in the ways. And I, I think rather than having one thing that, that was just there, you're going to have two things now. So you've still got the BKK under the lead, leadership of um, Shan Dave and the other board that they've got in there. They're going to go whatever route they're going to go and all the power to them. And now you've got a new branch that's come off with the... Uh, Shian Felix, Shian De Costa, um, Shian Hold Noddy Holder, I think it was, uh, and, and a pile of other and Darren, uh, like Darren, Darren Stringer, yeah. and a pile yeah. of other people have gone there. Well, mm -hmm. that's a new route. Could open up a new thing. See where it's going to go. Best of luck to them, and you know, all yep. power to them as well. Absolutely, absolutely. There doesn't. I don't think there needs to be. There doesn't need to be really a he said, she said, I did this, they did that, this and that, blah blah blah. It's like, well, listen, go your separate race, do your own thing, stay friends. I agree. I'm totally with uh, um, with Terry on this one, and, and it's weird. Like I'm trying to stay as neutral as I can, but at the end of the day, to Terry's point, things don't work. It's like a um, relationship of any kind. Thing you break up, you move on. And the healthiest thing to do, you just part ways and call a day and you do your best of luck to each party on their own. So that's it for me. Um, yeah. 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 We had, we had to bring that up because obviously that's, that's the big news that's going on at the moment. Yeah. And I know, and I've had people like commenting to me like, Oh, what's going to happen to you? And I'm like, I, I, I have no part of any of this. So no. anyway, literally, so I'm just... Scott, Scott, Scott's in BJJ anyway. He's like the do a kitchen. <laughs> so don't worry about it, folks. That's right. My focus has been on BJJ anyways. So you don't have to worry about me. <laughs> right, shall funny. we That's bring funny. the Aussie Oracle in? All right. Let's bring the Aussie Oracle in. Shall we? Yeah. Go bring on. him in. Cool. The only. Nothing's happening. Uh, lost him. He's not lost. He's there. Sean Cameron, if you can hear me, you are on mute and you have to open your. There he is. I can't see. I can't. Hey, Os. Hello. Os. Os, Sean. How's everything? Awesome. All 27 good. degrees and sunny in beautiful Toronto. We're all good. We're actually going through some incredible weather. We've got this. El Nino thing going on. Uh -huh. so the winds are like insane, and the the, the rain is out of this world. They're, they're expecting more flooding than they've ever had before. Oh, but anyway, oh. so you, are, you're moving into winter, right? Yes. Yeah. See, so we're just moving into summer, hence why. Yeah. Yeah. So at any time, it could get down to any, you know, anything, maybe even down to 15 degrees. Oh my God, that's brutal! Terrible! How do you survive? <laughs> Dude, well, that's that's summer, yeah. We, uh, that would be my summer. It is Terry's degrees. summer. <laughs> we, we we're tough, you know. We, we yeah, we, you re resilient. You get you you'll make survive. it through. Yeah. You'll survive. Yeah, I'm exaggerating. It does sometimes get down to you know a little bit cooler than that, but definitely nothing like your. Uh, some uh, your winter, you know. She on Cameron. I experienced minus forty this past winter. 
Yeah. Minus <laughs> 40 is quite bad. <laughs> Minus 40 is quite cold, isn't it? <laughs> it's a little chilly. <laughs> We we get up to about uh, minus ten at, at the push. But we do the extreme. So our summer will get up to plus forty, over forty. It gets are you very talking proper degrees now, or are you talking? Yeah, no, yeah. All of us, degrees. we're on our proper degrees, not the American <laughs> weird. And, yeah, no, like proper Celsius. Yeah, because they're like, oh my god, it's a hundred and two, and you're like, I, you would be cooking, you would be boiling. Exactly. How does that work? Because you're only forty. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we've um, we, we've messed our timings up a little bit. So we've caught Sean Cameron an hour early than when he was expecting to come on. Absolutely. Well, and, and, you know, we we haven't even done a proper introduction either. That kind of works out well because that'll give me time now to... Oh, we've got a bit more time now, yeah. Oh, awesome. Training and all that sort of... We've got more time, but also it gives me more time to, uh, you know, get ready for training and so on. Afterwards. Awesome. So... So I'm I'm just just off the top, like I, I know you don't need any introduction, but for people who may not be aware, the one percent or whatever, Sean Cameron Quinn, I believe Sean Sean, you're seventh Dan. Um, you've been training for I think over 47, 48 your years now, not to divulge your age. Uh I'm in my, I started in seventy one, so I'm in my seventy one. So yeah, yeah, more than that. So you're so, a little, yeah, well, you know, 51, 51 years, yeah, 51 years, something like that. Yeah, it, I mean, it was nice to click over 50 years, but I didn't even celebrate, <laughs> right? Right, uh, also, the author of probably one of the most, if not the most influential books in Kyokushin, The Budo of Karate, uh, of Masayama. Of Masayama. Uh, Get the name right, The Budo Karate of Masayama, that's what I said, and Uchideshi under Sosai as well. Uh, and also a, an official tra- became an official translator and close friend and confidant, I would say, of Sosai as well. I mean, most people know this stuff too, but uh, I just wanted to throw it as a basic intro for those uh, joining in. Yeah, well, there you go. I just <laughs> happened to be in the right place at the right time. <laughs> right. We was talking earlier, and uh, so you were probably, would you say you were the most foremost um authority on Sosai and his sort of legacy and history at the moment it's probably hard to say that i am the most no but i think i think xian is as as really you know there was a lot of research went into the book of course but and he was a respect, close friend but then i think of people like uh nick pettis and judd and you know they were uchideshi for three years Mm-hmm. I was in Tideshi for three months. Mm-hmm. And the, the difference was I was I, I did go there in 1976, you know, when uh, uh, Hiroshige Shihan, who trained all the great fighters, was still a brown belt, and uh, he was my instructor then. And um, that's when I first started um, probably more informally than formally translating for Solsai. They just had the eighth All Japan. I think they're probably up to the 50-something now. But they had the eighth All Japan, and he had a number of big-name guests coming out, you know, um, Shihan Bobby Lowe, Peter Chong, mm-hmm. Luke Hollander. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had um, John Jar- uh, not, um, um not John Jarvis, um, um, the uh, Oyama brothers. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Eric- Yasuhiko and Shigeru Oyama, uh, Miyuki Miura. Um, uh, was was Tadashi Nakamura still in then, or had he gone and no, left? He had left. Literally, he'd left uh, the month before I arrived, or just a matter of weeks before I arrived. Yeah. Have you ever Have you ever spoken to him? No. I. I no, that's not true. Yes. I've said hello. I, in 1980, I went to America. I was actually going to, it's an interesting thing how it turned out. Uh, I was off to America to train uh, in New York with uh, Kishi. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I planned to train for six, seven months there. 
And whilst I was in New York, I went and visited Nakamura Shihan's dojo and just observed training. They wouldn't let me train, but uh, I, I watched training. Uh, but what had happened was in Los Angeles on the way through, because, of course, coming from Australia, you come via the West Coast to New York. Uh, and whilst I was in California, I um, visited, I'd, I'd been following the yoga teachings of a certain teacher named Paramahansa Yogananda. And yes. I, I was living in an isolated area and, you know, just doing it all. There's my, that's it. did you hear that alarm? Oh, your alarm. <laughs> that's my alarm to say I've got 30 minutes to get ready for the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, but I stopped in LA because I had become a member and I was getting the, what they call the lessons, which is just some, um, mail order, well, not mail order, but, but correspondence mail lessons on meditation. So, on. so I thought I'd check it out on the way through and I was so enamored by it that I went to New York and I stayed with Kish, Kishi Shihan at his dojo for two weeks, but my head was just so much into the yoga right. that I just immediately went back to LA and stayed there for the rest of the year. <laughs> so I was in Los Angeles for about 10 months, I think, um, mm. doing the yoga instead. So, Shion, did, I you, don't it at did all. you train with Eric Paulson? Yes, a lot. Yeah, I thought so. Was that during that same time? No, I, I didn't know him then. Um, and would you believe ever? I used to just do my own training, so I was focused on the yoga. But what I do is every morning I get up, go for a run. I lived near, I lived in Hollywood, so I would run up to the Griffith, Griffith Observatory. Yeah, I'm was, familiar with it. So I'd run up the road to there, and I'd do some carter, and then run back. And then in the afternoon, I'd go to the LA City College, mm -hmm. which was just around the corner. Mm -hmm. And there was an athletic track there, and there'd be people, some people would be doing gymnastics, and some people would be running, and there was a group of guys who would do martial arts. And so I went, wandered over and joined in with them, and we just just trained. That's and cool. I remember, yeah, it was very cool, really nice guys. And I remember looking over, just near I'd leave my gear, there was a building about, I don't know, maybe 15 meters away and I saw these guys training in there and they, it looked like they were doing judo mm. but back then I was 21 years old and my head was in Kyokushin and so you know I didn't want to waste my time doing judo and so I ignored them it turned out that it was Jean LaBelle oh my god really yeah so I didn't even meet Jean LaBelle oh man. you I, missed it it was right there yeah well, uh -huh. which I don't regret because it, you know, look. You look at the possible scenarios. Like, if I went and trained with Jean Labelle, you could have um, gone. I, you may yeah, never come back to Kyokushin. Well, possibly. You know, yeah. because I was, mm -hmm. I was young enough that I had I'd fought in two tournaments, mm -hmm. uh, two nationals. But I was young enough that I was still impressionable, and I was still enjoying uh, um, learning. And Jeannie is very influential. Gene's a great mm. guy. Yeah. I still speak to him every week or so. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't regret it, but I didn't meet Eric Paulson or Gene LaBelle. Actually, it was really funny because in 1980, a similar time, maybe a few years after that, I was contacted by a guy in Melbourne named John Donahue who had <laughs> who had. Uh, arranged for um, Bill Wallace to come yeah. out to Australia and do a, a seminar. Now, I think Bill Wallace came in about 79 or 80, but this time was a second seminar tour. I think it was around 88 or so. And John Donahue was bringing him out. So he contacted me and asked me if I do the Queensland leg of it in Brisbane and the Gold Coast now. And so I'd gotten to meet John Donahue then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I knew Bill Wallace from previously where I'd interviewed him um, a couple of times for a magazine. I had an article in a magazine. 
But anyway, is that, um, is that where you is that where you started BJJ then with Donahue or? No, this is the interesting thing. He wasn't even doing BJJ then. He mm. actually uh, sponsored the Bill Wallace tour. They were great mates. So a little time after that, probably almost that year, if not the year after, mm. he then went to L.A. on Bill Wallace's invitation to do kickboxing with Bill Wallace. And Bill Wallace... Uh, introduced him. Bill Wallace is a good friend of Gene LaBelle's. Yeah. Bill Wallace yeah. introduced him to Gene LaBelle, and that's where it all started. Oh, um, wow. That's cool. Yeah. I think strength. the martial world was a, it was a small place as well, wouldn't it? Well, you no had internet couple, either. Yeah, you had a couple of big names, and they kind of knew everyone knew everyone. Especially in L.A., and especially in that yeah. particular fraternity. And He introduced John to Gene LaBelle. John started training Gene LaBelle. He's now, Gene only ever, tra- Gene's very old now, nearly yeah. 90. Yeah. Uh, he no longer trains. I phoned him up not too long ago and I said, hey, guys, it's not too good. He says, I'm not happy. I'm not yeah, running the chance. He goes, I'm not training anymore. I says, oh, no, what? I just don't have the coordination. I just don't have the re- response. So I'm wasting time. He wasn't happy. But then Gene, so John Donnie, who's one of Gene LaBelle's five black belts, mm-hmm. and Gene introduced John to Hegan Machado, mm-hmm. the Machado brothers, Carlos yeah. and Hegan mm-hmm. Machado. Mm-hmm. And then he started training with the Machados. So it wasn't until about, I think, 93 or 94 that I ended up in, our, in Los Angeles and I ended up at the Machado school. And I'm, I'm training with the Machados and between rounds, you know, they, they, they were rolling. And I was still young, fit, fast and furious from karate. So I'm every round, I'm rolling. This is great. <laughs> da, 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 da. And, and they think I'm this insane little rabbit, you know, just ah, more, more, more. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, yeah well, you know. And then at one stage you're sitting down and... I'm sitting next to this purple belt, and he goes, G'day, how are you going? And he was an Australian. I looked at him and said, I know you. And he says, mm, No, you don't. Because he never forgets people. But he, he's thinking in terms of Los Angeles. He'd been living yeah. there for, age for maybe four or five years. And he goes, mm, No, no, you don't. I said, Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you're John Donahue. He says, Where do you know me from? I said, you brought out Bill Wallace back in the 80s. I looked after the the Queensland thing. He says, Cameron Quinn. He says, oh, yeah. So that's when our friendship started. That's awesome. Yeah. And it was John that introduced me. Well, I I stumbled upon the uh, Machado brothers because I had another friend um, who I just saw him coming back into the hotel and he, he'd been training. I said, what have you been up to? He said, I've been over the road grappling with the Machados. And what do you mean over the road? He said, literally over the road at the little shopping centre was the Machado Brothers dojo across the road from the hotel. So I ran over, changed, ran over and, and joined in. So that, that's how I met the Machados. And then luckily for me, John Donahue was there on that day. Oh, shit. Because- huh. I went back on a different day if he wasn't there. So, so the stars and, were aligned. Yeah. Really, I mean, he was so influential in my training. He introduced me to uh, Gene LaBelle, to Eric Paulson, to Rico Ciparelli, uh, to Danny Inosanto. Of course, um, yeah. So uh, for, some, for some of the listeners, I mean, we've dropped, we've dropped a lot of names there. So, and we're talking around the wrestling, grappling um, sort of side of the coin. So, we've mentioned Eric Paulson, we've mentioned Gene LaBelle, uh, the Machado brothers. I- explain um, to some of the viewers. So, who is Gene LaBelle and what is his? <laughs> what is his? Because some people we'll might not out. know it, especially <laughs> Kyokshin people won't know. Um, right. Explain the significance of Gene LaBelle. Yeah, these are these are big right. names. Gene LaBelle, Eric Paulson, like these are big names, man. 
Look, back in Australia, I, there was a magazine called Australasian Fighting Arts. It was a really good magazine. It was, it was connected in a way to Terry O'Neill's Fighting Arts magazine in the UK. Yeah. And they, they worked together. And I had a column in it called the Cameron Quinn column where I would interview well-known martial artists. And, and I'd interviewed Bill Wallace and, and Benny the Jet. Mm -hmm. Another legend, yeah. A great story about those two guys when they came to the dojo at one stage too. But more to the point was in the interview with Benny the Jet, I says everyone, I said everyone says you're the greatest, but who in your brain is the greatest? He said there's only one man I would stake my wife, my daughter, and my Harley on, and that's Gene LaBelle. That's what I keep hearing. Player. That's what everyone says. And Not according to Steven Seagal. <laughs> Not according to Steven Seagal. <laughs> <laughs> um, Go on, yeah. Yeah. I said to him, well, uh, I'd never heard of Gene LaBelle. Who's Gene LaBelle? He says he's, he has forgotten, his fingers have forgotten more about training than all of us combined. <laughs> will ever know. You know, and I think, wow. And so, and then when I went to LA, of course, that's John introduced me to Gene LaBelle. And mm -hmm. look, I didn't really get an opportunity to train a whole lot with him. In fact, it was sometimes after John Donnie, who had returned to Australia, he was in LA for a year. Uh, I'm sorry, for 10 years, training, just dedicated to training. I've got to tell you, a lot of people go to LA, like me, a lot of people go, they train a day or two, come home, go back, train a week, go home, you know. And, and then we, you know, live on the names of the legends that sure. we mention when the reality yeah. is we only tra train with them piecemeal. Sure, John Donnelly yeah. And he for 10 years and he refused to go back to Australia until he got his BJJ black belt off Hegan Machado. Wow. Hegan Machado yeah. was the first black belt of the master Carlos Gracie Jr. Mm -hmm. who created the beautiful, wonderful and beautiful Gracie Baja uh, organization. Uh, and also he trained with uh, Jean LaBelle, who Bill Wallace introduced him to. Now, Jean LaBelle, he probably had more, more experience in that mixed martial arts world. He had a fight with a guy named Milo Savage, yep. who was a top boxer world ranked boxer mm -hmm. uh, in 63 it was the first ad uh, first um um broadcast mma fight yeah a box versus a judo guy and they realized the danger of it so they actually put some like heavy duty cheats in the in the boxing gloves um mm -hmm. and gene ended up choking him out <laughs> but uh, and getting Harassed, he had to. They had to run out of the gym and uh, out of the room and run away. But Dean's history is incredible. His, you know, he first learned to box off Sugar Ray Robinson. He was one of the ones that inf uh, influenced Muhammad Ali to get into the poetry and things like that because Gene was a pro wrestler as well. So he understood the importance of entertainment. Right. And mm -hmm. Gene's mum had the L.A. Coliseum, which was for 20 plus years was one of the meccas of the great fights of history. Oh, I didn't the, know that connection. That's interesting. Yeah. Oh, okay. She was the first woman to be inducted into the Boxing Hall of Fame. Oh, wow. Yeah, her history is also amazing. And Ooh, he grew up that. with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, she would promote Sugar Ray Robinson and Cassius Clay. And and Jean LaBelle tells a story in you know, talking to Cassius Clay, Clay before he's um, Archie Moore fight. And he said, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm just going to go out and knock him out. <laughs> he says, really? He says, yeah, just why wouldn't I? He said, because it's not about that. It's about entertainment. You mm -hmm. need to, you know. So he, uh, then he, uh, Muhammad Ali got influenced by some of the great wrestlers and then the way they would sell oh, themselves. Yeah. The yeah. showmanship. Yeah. yeah. Flash forward and, to Conor McGregor today. Yeah, absolutely. It is. But, but if you think about it as well, if you go, if you 
go to a big fight, a big final fight. You've watched all the preliminaries. You paid for your ticket. You got your suit on. You stood there. There's been hype for the last eight months. This is going to be an amazing fight. The first 12 seconds of the fight, bang, there's a knockout. That's the end of it. Good night, folks. And it's happened. It's Nothing happened. worse than that, is there? From, from a spectator point of view, it's not great. Yeah. yeah. From a I fighter just, point of view, it's fantastic. But <laughs> well, from a spectator point of view. Yeah. And so in the process, uh, John was very influential in the very early MMA and so on. He refereed mm-hmm. fights, the contenders, when it was still illegal. So he got arrested for refereeing, you know, these page fighting and yeah. in the process just near where he lived near the Machado brothers was a place at Huntington Beach called Boxing Works mm-hmm. yep mm-hmm. Boxing Works was where very famous places yeah well Rico Ciparelli was a mm-hmm. wrestler and he was a wrestler with Iowa Hawkeyes under Dan Gable mm-hmm. the Gable group, Grip that, he was called <laughs> yeah Gable. yep in- this grip where the thumb goes whoops that's 15 minutes to <laughs> out <laughs> so this grip where the thumb goes between the yeah. four that's the ga- that's the Jean LaBelle grip so you've got the Gable grip and the Jean LaBelle grip mm-hmm. and Rico Ciparelli was one of the great wrestlers he was sublimely Good at wrestling. In fact, was that I was that catch can wrestling or was that? Uh, it was freestyle collegiate wrestling. He yeah, okay, okay. So it wasn't catch as can. Okay. He wrestled with the Iowa Hawkeyes. I remember when I <coughs> interviewed him for a magazine, and uh, I asked him, "Look, I said, look, everyone knows your fighters, but no one knows your history." He said, "Well, my dad was the local junior high wrestling coach, so I joined in and." I ended up winning the under 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, and 20 U.S. championships. And it's like, what? You know, and <laughs> in multiple times collegiate champion, one of the great wrestlers of all time, and a sublimely good teacher, too. Mm-hmm. They called him the Zen Man. He, his ability to stay calm under pressure was legendary. Mm-hmm. And in the process, uh, with MMA starting to come along, you had – because of his connection to the wrestling world, he was very close friends to Randy Couture, Dan Henderson, Frank Trigg, mm-hmm. a Russian wrestler who'd come out named Vlad Matienko. Yes. And those guys wrestled with Rico under the Raw team. And so uh, Rico invited, uh, John was training with Rico. Rico invited John to come and work with them on their submissions. Rico was working on their wrestling, and and I that's where I, once again, I talk about brushing shoulders with famous people, but um, every now and then when I was in L.A., I'd put the pads on and I'd be working the, the kicks and punches of guys like Randy Couture and Dan Henderson, and wow. I rolled with, rolled with them numerous times. Some wow. Some enjoyable training sessions. On, I ever on, the, wrestling, training. on the wrestling, on the wrestling subject but we're on that subject of wrestling did you ever come across alexander carolyn no. <laughs> only, only at the sydney olympics when i actually went to watch him fight the final and he hadn't been defeated for so many years in the yeah. final he was fighting a guy named yes Rulon Gardner. yes yeah we did a show on it we've done a yeah. show on him right well you know um when he got robbed he got robbed Saturday, no, he didn't get robbed, actually. They, they changed the rule and then yep. robbed him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he got robbed of the title because they changed the rule. Yeah, but um, the thing was, Juan Samaranch was there, the, 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 I, the president of the IOC. Alex Popov, the former swimming champion who was the IOC rep for Russia, was also there. They were all there to give him the gold medal. <laughs> And Rulon, I spoke to Rico after that. I said, what's the story with Rulon Gardner? He says, he's just this guy who knew how to rise to the occasion. So when it was time for the Olympic trials, he would just smash it. 
Mm. And along comes that he, he was this big, incredibly strong um, farmer boy who mm. had a really big girth. And so what happened was the rule said if it was zero zero after yeah. the first round, they'd start with their hands clinched. Yeah. And they got yeah. in and Rulon Gardner just expanded his body and I was literally five meters away. Just his hand slipped just for a fraction of a second. And that, that was, was enough. It. Yeah. Point. Yeah. Because he, he, he went to change it to the other side then, but they said, mm -hmm. no, as soon, as soon as you release the grip, it's a point gone. That's it. So, you know, the, the reality is um, he got beaten by a better man on the day. I mean, everyone expected, everyone expected him to win by a country mile. But here's the thing, Rulon Gardner, even though he was, no one really knew his name outside of America, he then went mm. back in 2004 and won the Olympics again. Yes, yeah, mm. that's correct, yeah. So there's, there's no doubt about it that he was a, a, a serious player. High pedigree, yeah. 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 She, she on, you, I mean, you're dropping like huge names like Gene LaBelle and Eric Polson, uh, Superfoot Wallace, all these folks. Have you... If you could choose, I know this is a crazy, difficult question. Was there one in particular stands out more than the others in, in, in their knowledge or their skill base and being able to pass it on? Not really. They're, they're all so, they're all at the peak of their particular world. I mean, Rico was in there. Yeah. I mean, on any day of the week, you could go to Rico's and there'd be the great names of mm. BJJ, for example, coming to get private lessons off Rico. Wow. You know, okay. You had Hegan Machado, who Did was you train with Jean Jacques? Yes. Mm. I trained with all the Machados at some stage because they were right. all still yeah. together. Yeah. Um, but I I didn't train that much with Jean Jacques. I probably trained more with uh, Carlos Machado before he moved to Texas. Jean Jacques was always interesting to me because he had the the defect of his hand, and he was still able to you know obviously over. I mean he's he's produced so many black belts himself, including BJ Penn, uh, you know uh, I think Joe Rogan even under him. Eddie Bravo. Yeah, Eddie Bravo. Eddie, yeah. Main belt. I remember I was helping officiate at the ADCC in in um, San Diego at one stage and. John, Jean Jacques had asked them to allow Eddie Bravo to compete, but he was only a brown belt then. Right. Only allowing black belts. And he had said something like, look, let him compete. If he loses, I'll take my black belt off. Or he, he actually gave them some oh, wow. serious ultimatum. He was serious. And, he, and Eddie Bravo went in and tapped everyone, won the ADCC. Mm -hmm. Well, so he... he Everybody but, knows, I think, the story of Eddie then going to uh, Abu Dhabi and winning it and, you know, beating a Gracie. So tap, tapping Gracie, yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah. But you've got to remember, too, that um, in Australia, we had a wrestler named Chris Brown. Mm -hmm. Now, no one knows Australian wrestlers. But I, I said to Rico at one stage, have you heard of Chris Brown? And he just went, yeah, everyone's heard of Chris Brown. He was mm -hmm. just like an animal on the mat. And he was 17 times Australian wrestling champion. And he was winning, he was winning the age, like when he was 14, 15, 16, he was winning his age competition, then backing it up and winning the men's competition as well. <laughs> yeah. He competed in five Olympics. I think the best he did was a, he got a fourth or something like that. But he would go to America and train there, and they all knew him. He was just like a machine. And anyway, I remember John Donahue, because John had been exposed to Rico, and through Rico, Dan Henderson. We've lost yeah, him, have we? Yeah, he's frozen. Frozen. Yeah. Caliber of wrestling. And, and I remember once I was with John, he said, check this article out. And it was a photo of, of uh, Chris Brown getting ready for the Olympics. And he goes, you know, he's an Australian wrestler. He, he, he couldn't be that good. So anyway, <laughs> but I'll go and check him out. And lo and behold, it was Chris Brown who was really way beyond good. He was exceptional. Yeah. And, 
Chris stayed on with John and he got his black belt in uh, BJJ and he became a very good fighter. He, he fought for Australia in Abu Dhabi and in his first fight, um, he, he beat Henzo Gracie. And Which is incredible. Yeah. It is incredible. Yeah. And uh, it, it was an incredible match. And the photo of Chris Brown doing a high flare double leg and, and taking Henzo Gracie to the mat became the, yep. the ADCC uh, poster, poster photo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, literally. Yeah. So, so yeah, I think it's, it's – the, 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 the one I have spoken about – uh, Eric Paulson, he's incredibly knowledgeable too. Higa Machado would arguably, I'd say, probably, even though everyone talks about Hicks and Gracie all the time, yeah. I'd say Higgin was right up there. He was as good as Hickson. But even the Machados are incredibly respectful of Hickson. They, they oh, would, yeah. If, I mean, Huge. At, one stage, at one stage, Higgin fought Hicks and Gracie and had him, was beating him 17 points to zip and kind of started to celebrate too early and then got tapped at the very yeah. end with like 10, 20 seconds to go. So Higgin is right up there as one of the greats. Mm. Um, you know, I, I find Eric Paulson's actually even making – I hate – I'm struggling for a word, not comeback or whatever, but his, his popularity. I mean, for people not aware, like Eric Paulson was really into leg locks long before uh, that part of the body was even looked at in jiu-jitsu. And he got it from shoot fighting and that – and even now, today, like it's now become so much more popular. People are really back into training with Eric Paulson and looking at his videos. I think he was ahead of his time. I think so. I think, and he's still very innovative. Yeah. Uh, he, um, I probably ended up training with him as much, if not more, than all the others because over the years, see, I, the beauty of working with the airlines was our hotel where we right. stayed was right near the Machados, literally like a minute's walk to the Machados. How good was that? Then we yeah. moved hotels, but the hotel was still close to um, John Donahue. So I would, I, Meant to be. The hotel. I would go and stay with John mm. Donahue. And every day of this day, we're training with the uh, nighttime was the Machados morning was with Rico at boxing works. Uh, and then Eric Paulson's at lunchtime. But then afterwards, the hotel we stayed at was moved down to uh, Costa Mesa, which was yep. a long way away. But it was a, a car drive, so I'd rent a car and, and go to <laughs> Eric Paulson's. And uh, um, yeah, that I, was, I, that was I, the mecca in that at that time. It was yeah. truly, truly was the mecca for that. Uh, oh, so I. So, I get so got this. I gotta run out for a second. You guys keep going if you want. I just need to run out just for one second. But okay. I, but when we come back, you guys can keep going if you want. But I really want to know how it came from Kilkishin into this world. Well, this can is just I, what I'm gonna ask now. Go ahead. Can I pause this as well? I just need to go and grab something. Go on then pa pause it then and then we'll just edit it out. Yeah, all right. Right. So Shan, you've you've obviously got an extensive background in wrestling, grappling all that sort of side of it alongside your kyokushin training this is at the same time yes yeah yeah so I, what I, so I, go on i never stopped kyokushin and i never will stop kyokushin i mean no uh, what brought you just got it but what, what just got everything I, I do i have a bunch of questions i do have for like the earlier days for sure and so sign stuff i do i i, I have some stuff that well I this, this is you. where i'm this is where i'm going with it now okay. let me finish the question sure, go ahead so we've tra so we're still doing kyokushin we're training at humble and we've got this this wrestling grappling background as well on it quite extensive with the best people in the world at it so we've talked about this quite often how in kyokushin today the the grabbing throwing grappling elements seem to be lost and we, we've spoke about it ad nauseum on you um or whether they're I, lost or just the focus is not well now the gone focus to the has shifted on now. the tournament yeah. stuff yeah. but but obviously it's there and, and we know it's there um or historically when you would when uh, and saucy has got a wrestling background a judo background he was a, a grappling background as well 
but I, I want to know why. So everyone I've spoken to that trained at Hombu, um, and Gar- so Gary was out there just before you, um, and he was saying as well that they didn't do any grappling or throwing or anything at Hombu. So wh- why do you think Sorsai, because he's got this this extensive background in it, why it wasn't more prominent in Kyokushin? In those I, days, I have my own theory. I'm sure everyone does, actually, and I don't know that he had that extensive background at all. He had <sighs> experience in judo, and he was very close to um, Kimura Masahiko, mm-hmm. who was a great judo player. They actually traveled together demonstrating things, yep. wrestling. And he said that Kimura Masahiko was the only person who he treated as a senpai. In fact, uh, amongst, of course, his instructors are different, but amongst the students, it was only Kimura Masahiko who called Masayama Kimi. We call him Sosai. But in Japanese, you you refer to someone um, as Anata or Sensei when you're saying you or um mm-hmm. but to your juniors or to your lifelong school buddies it's kimi it's it's kimi is a reference that you would use to someone junior to you and what does it mean what does it mean it means you you know okay but it's just it's it's It'd be just like a, ki- like hey like kiddo okay yeah i get it yeah, like a term of endearment to someone mm-hmm. junior to you, you know hey buddy sort of thing you know and Kimura Masahiko was the only one that called Solsai Kimi. Interesting. Now, now um, I wrote about it in my book, but Kimura also trained with Sone Chu in the mm-hmm. Goju Do. In yep. fact, I found the, a, an image of the logbook, and he was listed as a six Dan Goju, and he was instructing there as well. So um, it probably he would have been instructing in the grappling side of it. Mm-hmm. But. He got. He mainly got influenced by Sone Chu with the Makiwara to make his grip stronger. Now, yeah, uh, Sosai was encouraged to go and train uh, judo for the the groundwork aspect, and and you know he said, well, in the reality of street fighting, it, you need to understand that if you don't have a handle on this stuff, uh, and a, and a judo guy or a wrestler gets hold of you well you're in big big trouble you know i found yeah. an, a really interesting article in i think i mentioned it in my book i'm not too sure um because I, I tried to find the actual physical magazine if i could find a physical magazine i'll buy it um but i saw the article online um when uh a, one of the great judo players was uh, a great wrestler, I think Lou Fares or someone like that, was about to fight um, the world boxing heavyweight champion. And they interviewed a number of people, and one of the people they interviewed was a professional wrestler named Mas Togo, the Togo Brothers. Uh-huh. Yep, yep. Uh-huh. Masayama. And his comment was, well, you know, and judo then was, it was all called um, judo. And so he was listed as the judo guy, Mas Togo. And he said, well, look, I don't think they respect the danger of the, the, the grappler, but if, you know, the wrestler, but if, if he, the boxer, um, it was, I mean, the world heavyweight champ, if I said his name, you'd know it, I just can't remember it. And if, if he doesn't respect the fact that uh, this is dangerous, he could be in trouble if, if if the wrestler gets hold of him, it's all over. And this is Masoyama saying this, you know. And so uh, I don't know that his objective learning judo was ever to introduce it into his own teaching world. When they were training, yes, they would, you know, in the younger days, in the 50s, when they were training for fighting. Mm-hmm. Well, then they would do all that sort of stuff. You speak to them and they'd say, yeah, but, but then gradually it moved away from that because the focus went from being the hardest, toughest street fighters 
to a martial art and the martial virtues and creating something that would serve society rather than just be a pain to society mm-hmm. and so the gradually as he started to put all the pieces together to create what Kyokushin karate was he could see that this the virtuous side was so important very strongly influenced by sonachu mm-hmm. and therefore and also he on the flip side there was no denying that you know there was a famous um confrontation between sonachu and uh one of gogen yamaguchi's sons yes sonachu of course was goju as well uh, but yama uh, not not, not yama- funakoshi's son it's funakoshi's um, yeah and the outcome was simply that sonachu just blew them out of the water with his power just kind of picked him up and threw him across the room you know because he was such a powerful thing and he wanted to point out that you can do this sublime beautiful non-contact technique all you like but under reality in against a non-compliant opponent they're just going as soon as they get their hands on you yeah yeah and so uh Sone Chu was a very strong man as well so there's no way that you could deny in those days the grappling arts you you walk into the dojo on any day and you can be sure that there was a judo guy or a wrestler there to put it on you you know mm. and, but in time when Masayama wanted to create something different he's a little bit he was a bit of an iconoclast so he was going well no more of that dance karate we're going to do bare fist full contact initially he wanted to wear pads but he realized that pad changed your technique when you put gloves on so he got away from that and then he stumbled upon something very beautiful and and the kyokushin tournament rules which have virtually not changed at all since they began in the 60s became incredibly exciting and when you have exciting technically beautiful fighters fighting in the tournaments the crowds were huge yeah you know and, and there were a number of events that happened outside of the tournaments which brought brought more and more attention to Kyokushin so Sosai had a he had something which was working and if it's working if it's not broken you, you don't, don't want to change it yeah and so there were certain aspects of of his training which just ended up getting denied and that you know and it's like I you speak to guys like Rico Ciparelli or even BJ J or John Donahue my god who trained so much in the in the um, wrestling system of Jean LaBelle where you know I mean Jean LaBelle when you wrestle with him from the second he touches you you're in pain yeah that's what I've heard yeah like he, he oh oh he goes Jesus he, at one one stage he cross faced me and neck cranked me and it was and it was so intensely painful i actually spontaneously just started to giggle i just said this is <laughs> and he said relax son if you don't relax i'll break your neck i won't mean to it'll just happen <laughs> you know <laughs> john donahue who is a very respectful man and it had spent so much time in the BJJ dojo he knew things that could tear these guys shoulders out and angles and things that he could do but you just don't do it right because mm-hmm. that's not the environment well yeah. with Kyokushin yeah. it's the same Solsai saw that what was going to attract the people was this system that he had of the full contact fighting sporting aspect of it and you know like uh like Judd and Nick said on on their talk at Hombu the the focus was on winning tournaments the focus was on yeah. 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 In, yeah in the west i would even say that in the west we would focus more on kata than they did in japan you yeah. you had people who were good at kata but they were only good at kata because they kind of had to be not because they really wanted to be in Kyokushin that is whereas other styles you'd have guys who were taking their kata training to a much much greater level than Kyokushin ever did and it wasn't sure. until later on and 
I'm thinking I had a degree of influence, but there are other people all around the world who don't have the same connection with SoulSide, so therefore they don't have the same profile. But they were doing things with Kata very beautifully uh, in different places with the Bunkai and so on. It's just that what happened with the Bunkai was because Bunkai arguably was created with a certain technique in mind, therefore in Japan they go, well, this Bunkai is this. And I remember once when I was preparing for my second Dan and, and I was talking to my buddy and I said, yeah, but couldn't it also be this? And he goes, no, it's this. That's what it's <laughs> for. Oh, that's funny. And, and then I remember, you know, just letting that go. You go, okay, fine. And then it was only later on, like I competed in the state, my Queensland state jujitsu titles in 1983. So I had this, this interest in this sort of stuff back then. A good while I, back. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't have anyone to teach me. Um, so I also basically let it go. And it wasn't until um, the early 90s, in about 92, uh, 93, I think, that out of the blue, I was with my good buddy, Brad Henson, who was a great, in, he was a great Kyokushin lightweight fighter who now lives in America, lives in the USA. He's actually a firearms instructor. But um, he and I just happened to be together and we, we met, he, he actually, I think, knew this guy. I didn't, I was visiting Sydney, but we went along and we did some grappling with this guy in about 93. And he taught me a loop token, which I just fell in love with, and I still use it to this day. And then I ran into a guy named uh, um, Larry Papadopoulos. Larry has fought the greats like he's fought Bas Rutan, he's fought, he fought in Pancrates in Japan. Okay. Uh -huh. He comes from a legit wrestling background and a legit traditional jiu jitsu background, and he put all those pieces together and would go and fight Shuto in Japan. He was, you know, he, he fought Pancras and Shuto in mm. Japan. And I just saw him one day coming out of a restaurant. He was with a, a guy named Alex Cook who went into MMA, he doesn't anymore. But Alex had no martial arts background. He was just a tough rugby guy. And, and uh, he learned some really great technique off Larry Papadopoulos and was it did quite well uh, in MMA so I started I said oh Larry my name's Cameron I do karate I love to come and learn some uh, some grappling so he Brad, Brad and I went along and trained with Larry as well and and then uh, that's where it really started for me and then in 90 I'd been going to LA doing a little bit with John Donahue and I think in 96, around there, could be wrong, around 1996, a guy uh, named Peter Dabeen, who was probably one of Australia's first legit BJJ black belts, he had been going and living in Brazil for lengths of time, for long periods of time, months at a time. You can't go for too long, of course, when you've got business and so on at home. But he was a very close friend of Carlos Gracie Jr. Who was who is still the president of the World BJJ Federation, and uh, he was bringing um, Carlos Gracie Jr. to Australia, so he contacted me again before the Queensland leg. There was no really very little, if any, jujitsu. Maybe one or two schools trying to get underway in Queensland. So I then sponsored um, the seminar tour in Queensland of of uh, Carlos Gracie Jr. And so that's where I met, got to meet him and train with him and the head instructor of the the Gracie Baja organization that is um, uh, Marcio Feitoza. He was just a young lad then. So that's when my, and that's when I really, really, dang, it was through John Donahue training with the Machado brothers and then meeting Carlos Gracie Jr., that, who was the instructor of Higan Machado. Higan Machado was Carlos Gracie Jr.'s first black belt. 
So that's where it really started with me. But at the same time, I had my Kyokushin Dojo and I was very busy at that time working to train, you know, to do my best to create some good Kyokushin style <clears throat> fight. Uh, but why did uh, you have such a draw, though, to the grappling side of things, do you think? Like, what piqued your interest in that? Well, I had a role. I had a, a, a wrestle with, as you know, they call it a role. You know? yes. And I had a role with Carlos Gracie Jr. But before that, I rolled with Marcio Feitoza. I, yes. Uh, Marcio Feitoza at that stage was a 19-year-old kid. He was, a, he was 10, 15 kilos. Can I interrupt for a second? You've yeah. passed by a lot of famous martial artists and trained with a lot of famous people. I just want to say, I'm, it's pretty, yeah. it's pretty inspiring. Every one of them smashed me, by the way. Oh, no. I anyway, remember, sorry, go on. I remember grappling with uh, Dan Henderson, who was a silver medalist at the Olympics. See? And Jesus. Him, yeah, and I remember rolling with him, and I'm going, it's like I'm stepping back, I'm a bang, thigh kick bang and you don't realize that when you're grappling guys who aren't used to thigh kicks they don't like thigh kicks <laughs> they hate thigh they kicks they hate thigh kicks and I've thrown another thigh kick and then bang next thing you know he's come inside that thigh kick and he's double legged me no he didn't double leg me he hip throwed me and as we're in the air I mean we were wrestling in this famous little backyard uh, octagon that one of someone had set up in Los Angeles and we're flying through the air and he's come in so hard and good wrestlers they don't like come in and bump you no but that's all weight they come in and they take you off the feet and before they've even touched you with their hands the force of their penetration step just boom like this so he's he's five foot in the air and I'm on top of him getting thrown and at the same, he's already neck cranking me, and I'm <laughs> tapping. I'm tapping whilst I'm. It was a choice. Do I tap? I or do, I, do I tap or do I break fall? So I thought, no, I'll, I'll bounce anyway. Let just let me tap to let him know if he keeps going, I'm going to snap my neck. You know, it was just like that sort of experience. But anyway, um, I'm. Yeah, but what I, got you into it? Like, why the interest to go? You know, you spent all this time Uchideshi with Sose. Well, yeah, it was experiences with grapplers. I mean, when I went and trained with Larry Papadopoulos, who to this day is a very close friend, and mm -hmm. he was he was the nicest guy. And oh, yeah. he he wrapped me up and tapped me and tweaked me and bent me. It's, it was just like insane. Yeah. And then when I um, rolled with Marcio Feitoza, <laughs> this guy was a 19-year-old kid who'd only just got his black belt in BJJ. In fact, I, for some reason, I think seem to think that I remember him as a brown belt. Then I remember him as a black belt. <laughs> so it was around that time that, and I remember rolling with him, and he was giggling. It was, uh, and I'd been training for like 25 years or something. You know? <laughs> and I'm thinking this little 19-year-old kid isn't even as old as I've been as long as I've been training. And it's like he just taps my ankle, takes me to the ground, and I'm and he's, you know, manipulating. Of course, but there's a couple of stories. You know, people often say, "Yeah, but you could have just like punched him or bitten him or gouged him in the eye." That it just doesn't hold water if they know what they're doing. Yeah. Anyway, I've I've rolled with him, and I've just this is insane. And then here's another thing which really got me even more excited i'm rolling with carlos gracie jr and he said to me and he's about my age he's maybe a year older than me mm -hmm. or, or maybe a year and a half older so around the same age he said what i'm going to do is i'm going to arm bar your right arm <laughs> but i'm going to arm bar your right arm i'm not going to use my hands i'm just going to use my legs and my body and all you have to do is not let me arm by your right arm. You don't have to worry about chokes, leg locks, the other arm, back to anything. All I'm going to do is arm by you, your right arm. And it took him, I mean, I'm, I, I must have been getting a bit better because it took him a while, it took him about 30 seconds to, <laughs> to 
who at me with the right arm. <laughs> yeah. that, I just giggle and he says, okay, this time I'm going to tap you in a way that you've never seen and you'll never see again. And what he did was he cross choked my thigh. He didn't oh. cross choke my neck. He cross choked my thigh and used the femoral nerve pressure to make me tap. Wow. I'm thinking, you know, I was a still pretty solid as a tournament trainer. Mm. I wasn't fighting anymore, but so I had what most people would consider to be Kyokushin legs. Mm -hmm. No way, bang, it's just going, <laughs> wow. So experiences like that. And then I had, I remember Carlos Machado. I was training with him once and, he, and you know, I was really fairly fit for my age and and I remember going in the Machados and just like I would never get tired. I would just roll, 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 roll. And Carlos said to me one day, he says, You karate guys. He says, Your 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 legs, your your body is so fit and strong. He says, but Cameron and he was we were just chatting. He says you karate guys, you have one chance to hit me. He says, one chance to kick me, to hit me, one chance to knock me out. He says, and if you do it, beautiful. He says, all power to you, congratulations. But if you miss that one chance, it's 100% guaranteed you lose the fight. <laughs> not even 99.9 .9. it's one percent because and then john donahue told me so experiences like that too i go i really need to i i kind of like also said if you want to call yourself a martial artist you can't be ignorant of the fundamental to the other stuff and john donahue told me once where a kempo guy kempo was big in los angeles because of ed parker that's my original background. That's my original right. black belts. Yeah. You know, yeah. Well, they they have some great stuff as well. And a Kempo guy had come into Jean LaBelle. So John Donnie was there. And Jean LaBelle was teaching this certain technique. And this Kempo guy is talking to his training partner. And Jean said, have you, have you got something to say, son? And he's oh well no, I was just saying actually that's that wouldn't work with me. He says, Well, why wouldn't it work with me? And he said, Well, I'll show you. And so whilst Gene's doing the technique, he bit Gene, says, Here, uh, you know, I just bite you. And Gene said, Well, yeah, biting's good, but we don't do it here. So anyway, a little later on. Gene wanders over to um, John Donahue and smiles and says, it's going to be a long night for someone tonight. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so he grapples with that guy, right? And he does the exact technique that that guy said wouldn't work on him, which was a cross choke from the mount. And he just okay. he chokes the guy. And Gene LaBelle is a former pro wrestler. So he, you know, he knew how to ham it up. Yeah. He loved hamming it up. So he's choking this guy and the guy starts to tap. But he doesn't let go. He just looks at him and goes, <laughs> and, just, <laughs> and knocks the guy unconscious. And then John walks over and says, you want me to revive him? And he says, no, nah, let the son of a bitch suffer. I'm just going to stay here. So the guy wakes up. And Gene LaBelle's still sitting on top of him. So Gene just grabs him again and just goes, <laughs> and knocks him out again. <laughs> and then when he wakes up, he bends down and he bites the guy on the nose. <laughs> That's then Genie. He the ear. Then yeah. he bites him on the other ear, bites him on the eyebrow, bites him on the other eye, bites him on the neck. And then he slaps the guy and says, you get my drift, son? The one who's in control is the one who bites. And this is the big fallacy that a lot of people Fuck. say. If you want to get out of that, you bite their finger. Or... No, 
you're not going to get away with that if they have their stability and control. You know, that's, they're just going to be angry. That's literally the best I've ever heard about that whole thing. We'll all just bite you and, and real. That's awesome. Now, and that so speaks volumes of Jeannie LaBelle. That's exactly his personality, which is pretty damn cool. But, and you're right. Like I've heard it in like other like MMA fighters talk about, you know, people go, well, that's a still a sport and I would do this and do that. And MMA fighters are like, um, I know how to bite too. <laughs> yeah. It's so silly. I don't think, I don't think people like, and, so certainly silly. karate people today i don't think if you haven't got any any idea of grappling or done any grappling i don't think you realize how defenseless you are exactly as Shan just said exactly. if you miss that shot if you miss that shot or that punch and they get hold of you exactly that's good night that's the end of it that's if you've got experience. no knowledge if you've got no knowledge of like when when i'm i'm grappling with my bjj coach when he puts me in a raised butterfly guard and you're just uh, and you're floating in the air and you're like <laughs> like an idiot what, what what the fuck do i do i can't put my arms down because he's gone my arms i can't put my legs down because he's got me in the butterfly and you're like i can't do anything i can't move i'm just floating I, yeah you know shihan i say to terry all the time like since i started doing jujitsu it's so much more humbling than anything else i've done it's a such a humbling martial art well, I mean, wrestling can be very similar to it, but wrestling's more dynamic, so you don't get the same. Yeah, you don't get the same. I call it the baking. You don't. Yeah. Get, you don't get put under pressure and and baked. You know, when they put you. I mean, if someone gets you in a kessa, that's a different thing. I mean, yeah. wrestling has a kessa too, and they can bake you in yeah. a kessa. But yeah, it, one of the best ways to take a stand-up fighter and make them realize how defenseless they are is just put them in it and one of a number of positions and just bake them just yep play with the pressure and yeah yeah you, you do diaphragmatic pressure and they literally get claustrophobic and start to panic these yeah. Yeah, the pressure yeah Pe people don't know if you've got some if you've got and i was always told by a, a friend of mine mark who was did catch wrestling oh you met you met mark mark Coase when you went to um Tom Blumen's funeral. Yes. So, so oh, he's got a he's got a catch wrestling background as well, Mark. He's an all over top top guy, and he always told awesome, me awesome we, pressure wrestlers because we always told me wait on the person, not yeah. on the mat. Yeah. So there's always top pressure on the person, and I don't think people realize when you're on the floor and someone's on you in such a position where you you can't breathe. It's you suffocating. Can't expand, Best. you can't get a you can't get a deep breath it's it's really panicking it's almost like drowned in yeah well yeah and it's you know it's the great equalizer you know I, that, I, that Shion, I want to know like because i i want to be cognizant of time too like uh and based on like your history in kyokushin and and how you see it where do you see that grappling aspect and you know that part of martial arts if you will does it have a place in Kyokushin? well i think it does and i i there's you've got the stand-up fighting then you have the tournaments right and tournaments are the subsection tournaments are the the arena of young fit fighters yes mm -hmm. and if you look at the fighters of the first world tournament they're all some have died of old age yeah they're older yeah. dudes yeah late 60s, early 70s, late 70s, you know, probably some are even in their 80s now. Uh, the, the, the point is, what do you do when your body can't take the impact of full contact training? Now, some guys go, That's yeah, Terry no, and I, I always talk about. Mm -hmm. I still spar and I still, you know, and it's like, yeah, but how enjoyable is it really? You can't, you can't take the shots. No, you can't. The recovery is not I mean, there. I, I, I mean, Shian is how old you know Shian? Sixty-four. Yeah, I'm 54. fifty. I'll be fifty-two next week. Terry Scott's and I talk 52. about this. I'm forty-two, yeah. and I and I feel the difference now from when yeah. I was in my twenties. You get hit with a shot, and you're like, oh, I can feel that, and you can still feel it a couple of days later. Yeah, and you're like, oh, I don't heal as quick as I used to. Yeah, so I mean, training, 
literally as you get older becomes uh, and uh, the aim of it becomes go home without an injury yes mm. all you think whereas the old way of thinking used to be if you haven't gone on with an injury you haven't trained <laughs> right you want to go home beat up yeah. yeah and so then you have to go okay well and this is why a lot of people leave Kokushin because they've never gotten outside of that bubble realm of tournament fighters because and it's possibly their instructor you know the the problem with the hierarchy and the grades is that often instructors are too embarrassed to admit that they don't know something and so what happens is when it's time to move on past the tournament arena they don't have any answers right. so they either start making stuff up right. rather than having the humility to go okay well i'm going to go and um, do a serious research analysis. Yeah. yeah, we talked about this the the other week on yeah. what is a Xi'an. So to me, I think a Xi'an is like that professor where right forget forget the tournament stuff now. Now you need to delve into what it is you're actually doing. What is that? Where does it come from? Why do you do it? How do you make it better? Uh, that you should be looking at those sort of things. I think yeah. so. I think. I and think, like it, Sol, Solsai said, that Kyogushin is a lifelong pursuit of improvement and and uh, technical advancement. Well, then, you know, Kyogushin probably has around, I worked out, uh, probably maybe four or five hundred basic techniques mm -hmm. and combinations that you need to go from white belt to black belt. Mm -hmm. uh, Rico Ciparelli said the reason so many Olympic wrestlers have been wrestling since they were five years old because there's probably 30,000 basic techniques that they have to master before they get to the point where they can make it work perfectly against a, a high level yeah. opponent. You know? mm -hmm. So um, there's that whole realm of the ranges and that's why I, well, I know other people do it too, but I talk about the five ranges mm -hmm. and see martial arts can be classified purely on the ranges that they choose to operate within. So Taekwondo is essentially range one and two, maybe 90. If Taekwondo says you will win an Olympic gold medal if you knock them out, they go, okay, I'm gonna work 90% of my training will be in kicks. Yes. 10% will be in punches. Yes. And you watch the Olympic Taekwondo and I reserve judgment on it, but what I'm saying is people in that area, if they yeah. want to win a, a gold medal, they spend most of their time That's in range one. Yep. Kokushin is maybe, you could argue either way, but 50-50 kicks and punches. Mm -hmm. Depends on the fighter, 60-40, 70-30, 30-70. Okay. Muay Thai is range one, two, and another 10, 15% in the elbow range. In the clenching. So, yeah. Yeah. And then... You go, you move, you keep moving across, and you have um, wrestling. Yeah, is basically probably seventy-five percent range for stand-up wrestling, twenty-five percent on the ground. Judo is probably because in judo you win the Olympic gold medal with a nice throw, so they're eighty to ninety percent stand-up, and ten Think to down. twenty percent on the ground. Yeah, and then JJ is the inverse you got to get to the the ground so they still have to address the stand up so they look at maybe 10 percent if they're lucky stand up and 90 percent on the ground so it's the rules of the game that they choose to participate in that determines but the thing is when you remove the rules and the referee you have to be prepared that someone can do anything. you have to transition yes, i think i've always exactly. said it, it's a it's a good fighter who can transition through the different ranges. That's what makes a good fighter, all-round fighter. But it yeah, changes yeah. whether you're calling it a sport or, to your point, like a fighter. What is the difference there, right? Yeah. And even within a particular sport, quite often, someone who can transition and change angles and dominate. Right. Is the one but we look at MMA. We 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 we've got to look mm -hmm. at MMA as really the the uh, the ultimate form of of combative expression within rules, isn't it? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Because you can punch, you can kick, you can grapple, you can do anything. But even there, to Xi'an's point, you will see people who are more focused on specific areas. Well, you've looked at them. You've, lo you've looked at some grapplers that in the stand-up, mm -hmm. they won't throw any punches or kicks. They'll sit on the floor and then mm -hmm. just tell them to come on. Oh, yeah, sitting in guard. That's so, yeah, anyway, yeah. Well, so the you know the question was well, what role do you think is going to play in Kyokushin? Well, I mean, it, that's Kyokushin now. There's no there's no single entity called Kyokushin anymore. That's you've got people who claim to be Kyokushin who, in my opinion, have never really legitimately trained for uh, very much time in Kyokushin. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got you got like that guy in Poland who walks around with a tenth dan on, <laughs> and probably legitimately a green belt or a brown belt. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you've got other people who have their black belt, who then think, well, now that the flavor of the month is bunkai, so I'm going to get into bunkai. Yeah. And but they have no deep. Not interested, do they? Well, they have no deep experience training with someone who really. So you train with someone who knows grappling. Yeah. And when they touch you, they touch you in a different way. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. They hold you, they hold you in a different way. And you feel it. And you need to feel that. And unless you felt it, it's all talk and no action. There is there's yes. plenty of Kyokushin guys and, and I love Kyokushin. Look, I'll never ever stop my life mission is to make people realise that Kyokushin continues to have amazing values but i've met so many people in kokushin who talk about grappling and this and you can tell by their touch that they have absolutely no idea or at least very limited idea of what they're talking about 100 percent. i was telling yeah. terry actually in her last episode i i had the fortunate um time a couple of weeks back to wrestle do some uh, um uh, <laughs> Yeah, some I didn't do much. He did uh, of grappling with Habib's cousin, a, a, literally a cousin of Habib who drew, grew up in that area of Kazakhstan, Dagestan, Dagestan, sorry, and and, Dagestan. And, and grew up in that wrestling environment. He's now here doing jujitsu. Sweetest, most humblest, nicest guy. But the coolest thing, he just let me play like he was just like do anything, whatever. But to your point, his touch was incredible. I knew that he could just do anything he wanted at any time, and it was incredibly humbling. It's like chess. Look. Yeah. Yeah. You can learn the moves of chess, and you can know you can you can teach someone the moves of chess a week after you learn the moves of chess. Right. Mm -hmm. But you know there are more possible moves in chess than there are atoms in the known universe yeah yeah and the point is that when a beginner plays chess they think of one move ahead so they can make the same move as a master but they're making it for a completely different reason and completely mm. different complexity a master mm. will make a move already knowing setting the, up the 10 different choices you have and they have an immediate response to that. And, you know, they're thinking literally seven, six, five, four, five, six, seven moves ahead. And that's well, exactly how it felt when I was rolling with that guy. Yeah, exactly. When you grapple, I mean, I, John Donahue, who I have such respect for his skills, you, you roll with him and it doesn't matter what you do. He knows what you're going to do. So he just lets you do it. Because <laughs> he knows, and he knows another way. <laughs> exactly. Like, like the, what He's you not concerned like, at all. What yeah. you feel like when you roll with those guys is, you walk away thinking of the old saying: if you give a man enough rope, he's going to hang himself. Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> and that's exactly what what jujitsu is. This, like, well, no, I'm I might name this, this like, episode yeah. that. <laughs> you you carry on going for that because I know where you're going to stop and I know what I'm going to do afterwards. And here's the, the the beauty of BJJ is that in Kogashin you can have an orange belt can beat a black belt if he's harder and tougher and knows how to. Well, we had a guy many years ago, really nice 
guy named Mark Zod, and he was a 10th Q. Mm -hmm. But he happened to be the Australian amateur heavyweight boxing champion. <laughs> so so a true 10th Q. <laughs> when, he'd fought, when he'd fight tournaments, he'd just come around and just go, crack, crack. <laughs> he won the Australian heavyweight, Togashi heavyweight title. <laughs> so impact, impact sports can be won by anyone, anytime. You know, if, if you get a kick on, if you get a punch yeah. on, body mm. but bjj because of the nature of its control yeah. it's very clearly delineated of course there's always laps overlaps but in general in general the white belt won't beat the blue belt the blue belt won't beat yeah. the purple belt. there's always exceptions but in yeah. general if you were to do a bell curve yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. you're gonna have 10 percent one way and 10 percent the other and the delineation between white belt and blue and purple and brown and black is insane. You, yeah, you can't 100%. Mm. Possible that yeah. these guys train in the same school. And the, the, the main thing is you look at someone like Roger Gracie, and I'm a big, big fan of Roger Gracie. One, because he's a really nice guy. But two, you look at Roger Gracie in his 2008 World Championships. And... I could be wrong, but I understand that on that day he beat eight former world champions. Mm -hmm. Beat them all from the same position mm -hmm. with one or two techniques, which he learnt in the first couple of weeks of training as a white belt. So it's not that, see, in Kyokushin, you will learn more techniques and, and so on as you go up, you know, and you'll see certain guys will be doing jumping spin back kicks, which he won't learn as a white belt. Mm -hmm. But in BJJ, you'll see guys win a world black belt title using a technique that they learned yeah. as a white belt. Yeah. The difference is that it's an inch wide and a mile deep, and they'll get the, the, a white belt. One way to look at it is a white belt will be so busy trying to survive that he'll, like, he'll use one hand his brain is in one hand and then a blue belt will have his brain in two hands yeah great analogy a blue belt against a white belt will have his brain in everything but a blue belt against a brown belt or a black belt will have his brain in two hands a purple belt will have his brain in two hands and a foot a black yep. a brown belt will have his brain in two hands and two feet and a black belt will have his brain in two hands, two feet, and his head as a fifth limb. Yeah, perfect analogy, perfect. So uh. they do exactly the same techniques, but the, the, the black belt will just move his hip just like that, just do yeah. that. Next thing you know, yeah. you're going, oh, oh, boom, and you're falling over. And it's true, it's those oh. subtle little things too that they... It, it exactly, is, you, when you, you're rolling and, and you like, He'll move his wrist two inches, yep. and you're like, "Yep, something, something's going to happen." I hate it when they, they start untucking your gi, or they'll start moving. Yeah, yeah you, you just, know they're going to. They'll start doing something, and you're like, "I know <laughs> something bad is about to happen." And you I can't don't do know anything. What it is. I can't stop it. I just got to wait for it to happen to me. But, but, or uh, you think, you think, yeah, look, I've been in this situation a thousand times. Yeah, I know exactly what I'm going to do here. So you go, okay, now. And you go, and you go, well, what does happened? it work? And it, why can't I move? And it's like they knew what you're going to do before you move. You did it. So the, all they did is they put their hand there. Yeah. They, it's gone boom like that. I, I remember once. I like, really uh, need to take a bio break, guys. I'm so sorry. Just a say, what? A bio break. I got to go pee. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. You, you're saying about that. So one of my students, Bryn, brings a blue belt in BJJ, and I've been trained. It's funny, his his coach is an old friend of mine from college. So I've been going there as well now. I used to do a little bit under Pedro Bessa back years and years ago. Um, so I've started going there now, and I'm a two-stripe white belt. So I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying being a white belt again and learning new things and going through things. So from a... A karate point of view, I've always been a good grappler with other karate people because I had a little bit of a clue and they had no clue. But when I'm 
a role in with Bryn because he's a blue belt. He's got much more experience than me in the grappling. I was going to go for a Juji Gitami on him, an arm bar. And I was working and working and working and probably spent about 10 minutes work, working myself into the position where I'm like, I know what, he hasn't got a clue what's coming. I've got him. I'm going to put him on this, this arm bar and I'm going to tap him and he hasn't got a clue. I'm being so subtle. The moment I got off, he just twisted his trailer of it because he knew it was coming. He was like, yeah. yeah, I knew you were going for that. I said, just waiting. I was waiting like 10, 15 minutes for you to s- stop wriggling and, and put all your effort into that. And then I just flipped you over and did something else. Yeah, it's uncanny how, uh, um, you know, there's a saying in BJJ, of, of which I, I, I can't remember it, but it's something like, um, you know, a, a blue belt to beat um yeah they, they say it's, you you only need a blue belt to beat the world yeah that's right and, that's all and then to beat the blue belt you need to be a purple belt yeah and i can remember um when i was going through the ranks and i'd go and train with these guys as a white belt and a blue belt and it's like it, it, literally you'd get spanked by these guys in such a sublime way with such so, like, so what grade are you now in bjj brown belt so you were brown belt yeah and these guys and, just, and for people for people listening all right because uh, our listeners won't don't really understand the grading system of jiu-jitsu mm. so i would say we look as a brown belt in kyokushin as like you know that's someone that's a little bit experienced and you know they're going for their show dance and then they're going to start learning things but i'd probably say a brown belt in bjj would you say it's probably the equivalent to a knee dan? I don't know. I've never really thought about it like that. But in, in but terms of knowledge, that, look, I do know that, and I'm a lot older. Look, it's, it's, it's the thing about BJJ too is that um, there's a very clear delineation in the ranks too, in terms of age and your body's response to things. So yeah. if I'm a brown belt at 64 rolling with a brown belt who's 24 mm. well then i've got a i've got a real job on my hands to even just survive you know yeah but at the same time i just think it's uncanny that maybe as a brown belt in bjj i would pretty well back myself uh if i had to grapple um pretty well anyone in kyokushin um <laughs> Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, simply because of the nature of the training that you do, you know, yeah. would you just I can remember when, yeah. when Nick Pettis came out to Australia, we did he did a seminar tour many years ago, maybe twenty five years ago, <laughs> and at some stage Nick said, Well, you know, you do a session on grappling. And so I was grappling and I'm I'm they're all Kyokushin guys, and I'm grappling with guys who had a lot of experience there were black belts and and uh, very highly ranked um highly successful tournament fighters and everything and it's like grappling with them and i maybe might have been a blue belt but mm. grappling with them was like a giggle yeah like, <laughs> when, you, when you roll with bjj guys who understand base stability and accurate grips they're the yeah. two things yeah mm. when you know someone knows how to grip accurately and and keep the stability then then you know that they're a grappler yeah because the the accuracy of the grips is vital but when you roll with someone who's never grappled their their gripping actually puts them in trouble mm. and so i can remember back then it's like i'm rolling with guys who are high level high tournament fighters fought in the world tournament and so on and you tap them at will it's like you you actually stop tapping them because you're embarrassed yeah she bored of tapping <laughs> and this is, you know and then you transfer and i'm a i'm a no one in bjj could you imagine how good some of these guys are when they can mm. do that to other bjj black belts exactly exactly you know, insane how you have such 
clarity with the delineation from rank to rank to rank and from stripe to stripe to stripe like that you know mm. yeah i i'm i mean scott is scott's a proper little bdj bitch now he's going over he's going over to the dark side but i've um i've really enjoyed going back to being a white belt you know, I I've love done it. thirty years. I've done thirty years it. of Kyokushin. I've done a bit of judo. I've I've touched on stuff. I've done bits, but never really delved into it and become part of it like I have done with BJJ. Now I'm with the lads. I'm grading. I've got my two stripes, and we're we're going. You know, eventually I want to compete. I do want to have a go in a, you know, in 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 a novice category or a white belt category. You just know to you see, because it's been. You know, you can't strike them though, right? Why not? Well, if I feel, if, if I feel I'm about to be tapped, I may just come out instinctively. Oh, Lord. But I, I do want to, I mean, I haven't competed for years and years and years. So I'm nervy, but I do want to, I do want to go and feel what it would be like competing against someone else. No punching and kicking. So I haven't got to worry about having broken ribs. I haven't got to worry about being knocked out. Um, joints. It's, yeah, yeah, just having all my joints snapped and my, <laughs> my tendons snapped. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm enjoying the process of it, of going through it, and these these new things that click, and I and I can relate it to karate. So and like certainly now, my, I'm the love of karate now as I'm going through the grappling aspects of it and trying to trace back to Tegumi. Uh, the Okinawan wrestling, trying to trace the, the lineage through the karate of what we're actually doing. Oh yeah, that makes sense. That that could be that throw. Yeah. And who are you, uh, you training sorry? the te- Who are you training the tegumi with? Not under anyone. There's no one around you specifically to do it under. I'm just piecing bits, bits from text and old videos and whatever I can get my hands on. And he's the Ronin. Be careful you don't become one of those people that we talk about who, who mm. you know, talk. They, they say, oh, yeah, I'm doing Kyokushin. So who do you train with? I'm just doing it, if you could imagine. No, I'm just yeah. piecing from what I find online because Tegumi <laughs> is a very legitimately well-established martial arts system in its own right. Yeah, so yeah, in Okinawa. Yeah. So if you want to start you know, doing Tegumi, or even saying that you're doing Tegumi, it's like someone saying they're doing Kyokushin, but they've never actually trained in Yeah, Kyokushin. well, no, I, I'm not doing Tegumi, but I can see the links from Tegumi when it went into karate and what is going on. I'm trying it because I'm the karate end of it. So yeah. um, when I look at when I look at something like a script of Tegumi, and they do that, and I think, oh, well, that that's actually quite similar. Um, Oh, look, that, that's like when you look at Funakoshi's nine throws in his books and you've got like a, the, the neck throw and you're like, oh, that, that they look quite similar. They look and I'm trying to get the links there, but there's no one. Certainly, I don't know anyone in Britain who's actually a, a Tagumi guy. It's quite old, 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 isn't it? Sorry? It, it's, a, it's a very old art, isn't it? I, I, don't know, I don't know much about it. I'd, I'd love to go like one of my bucket list things is to go to Okinawa and do some training there and too, one of my yeah. one of my students here at the dojo um, lived in Okinawa for a couple of years and his wife is Okinawan <clears throat> so I'd love to go over and, and actually experience it um, but I think what we we're talking about you want know, a connection where where it all fits in with Kyokushin well I mean as if you want to do Kyokushin for life you're going to have to do something more than sparring and, and mm, you've got exactly. to get away from the impact because yeah. your body can't afford the injury. Exactly. So the next step is then, this is where I love the kata. And I remember mm-hmm. I was not leaving, I was in Hong Kong once. <laughs> well, this particular time I was in Hong Kong and I went for a wander down to Victoria Park early in the morning and that's a big park in the middle of um hong kong and the there are hundreds and hundreds of people doing martial arts they're like that some guys are doing more legitimate stuff some people are just doing their tai chi other people are just doing you know qigong stuff and they're all doing something 
you know, and then mm -hmm. it, it doesn't matter what they were doing. The important point was that they were doing, doing exactly. And mm -hmm. I think that's really, really important because, you know, you have, um, uh, Itosu Anku's uncle, uh, Anko Itosu, right? And you have this thing called the, the Ten Mottos. Well, it, well, they're just ten points of karate, but eventually became known as um, Itosu's Ten Points, you know? Yeah. And he pointed out, too, you know, and, and he said, you have to determine whether your karate will be primarily aimed at, like, physical health and culture of the body or cultivating skills for real fighting is that it doesn't matter which one they're both legit even if you're just doing karate for health that's a hundred percent okay mm. but don't confuse the two don't think that because you're doing karate in one form or another it's going to help you in a real confrontation we talk about this all yeah, the time I, exactly so i'm sitting here like like shihan yeah like i was thinking about it myself like like i said i'm turning first 52 next week I'm in Kyokushin for quite a few years. I have a Kempo background. I've done Shito Doru and things of nature as well. Breakdown of like Okinawan martial arts. But I see Kyokushin. I'm like, I'm not going to be able to use Kyokushin in a practical application if something were to go down. This is not going to happen. I'm not going to stand in the street and stand and bang, kick someone with, you know, get on Mawashis and stuff. It's just not going to happen. And, and, it, and for me, it made me feel very... Um, I don't know, like I was missing tools or something. So when I started doing despondent, yeah. And so when I started doing jujitsu and grappling and stuff, it it opened up such a more um, uh, avenue for me because it, it it opened my toolbox. So I'm like, okay, if something were to go down, I have now have different. Now I can subdue somebody, somebody hopefully at some point. I can subdue someone, hold them until help comes. But I also have that background of knockdown in case things go awry uh so for me it's just a missing element i think too sometimes we underestimate the effectiveness of our karate because we don't actually uh mm -hmm. expose ourselves to non-compliant opponents right i remember many years ago i had a a female student and we worked this stuff so you go would that really work under president you go yeah, look, just have faith in it. It'll work. Yeah, no, well, would it really? Would it work? Yeah, I don't know. And one day she got attacked. Mm. And there was a, a case where a guy was hanging around a particular train station attacking women. And I saw her one night and she ran up to me and she said, it works. I said, what do you mean? It really works. And she'd been attacked by this guy, and without even thinking, all these things came out. Good. And she was able to not only survive that, but survive anything that the guy wanted to do, and uh -huh. escape. And she said, it really works. That's awesome. And she became a lifelong devotee of Kyokushin. She, she ended up running her own dojo and everything. That's and, awesome. Yeah, so the point is, it's very easy to say, yeah, would that stuff really work under pressure? But you might be surprised. It's mm. not actually, until the pressure the comes. Side, that's it. The flip side too is that we do have to question what we're doing and put it in the realm of uh, reality. Mm -hmm. And would it really work under pressure against a non-compliant opponent? And I, and and I we, think. Sorry, I don't want to cut you. We have to I, ask ourselves that, and we have to train accordingly if that's your thing. But we mm. we minimize the middle-aged student or the child or everyone does. Masayama used to say everyone, you know, people join for different reasons. Right. Then mm. fine. We can't minimize anyone's reason for wanting to train. Right. Yeah. And reasons change as you go on. Like my yeah. mine have changed. I my you know my karate originally was uh, as you know, Shian, just pure effectiveness. If it doesn't work, it's a waste of time. It's got to work in a real fight, 
in my environment as a doorman has got to be it's got to work for me mm-hmm. um and it was all about being realistic well obviously i am i've been on the door now for over a decade i don't i try not do i stay away from fights i don't get into fights outside now so my karate has changed now and although I, those still elements are important to karate for me but it's become more now of just being a little better than i was yesterday trying to understand the history more so of it now as well i don't need and i've learned now that as you just said you don't realize how proficient you become now i've come to the point where there's no point in me engaging in a fight outside because i know the result and the result is normally me in handcuffs so <laughs> I, I i i need to stay away from it i don't even need to bother with that anymore now and now go down a different avenue of of character and and being a better person but I'll, i sorry before she on you respond to that i also want to point out though that uh, apart from this stuff and back to like because my back are more in psychology and stuff Terry, you, Shihan, myself, none of us, you're not the same person as you were in your teens. No. You're not the same person as you were in your 20s. You're not the same person as you were in your 30s. You're not the same person in your 40s. You really are. You, we really, every 10 years, we change dramatically. So as part of that, our philosophy on these things are going to change as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely right. I think... Uh over time particularly when you're talking in terms of decades Mm -hmm. uh, unless you began already with a very clear unusually perceptive unusually advanced uh reasoning for joining as a youngster well then it's only i I wanted to be a ninja turtle (laughs) yeah there you go (laughs) i still hope terry so of course (laughs) your your things are going to change yeah Mm -hmm. Some people they don't change as much as others, right? Uh, but the nature of their training changes. Their objectives may not. Just the yeah. way they go about it can can differ very much. I just think as you get older, the the primary thing is you have to look after your body. Yeah, uh, mm. you have to take, take care of that you don't get injured. You know the number of hip knee and ankle injury in karate is just insane and it's got a lot to do with uh i think um jigsaw mats i think have a lot to answer oh. for i think one day someone somewhere is going to do some research and do a correlation of uh lower limb injuries when it comes to jigsaw mats but i was talking to a friend recently and he pointed out that in shotokan who and quite often people he know who train in Shotokan on wooden floors, they have a similar number of, of lower limb well, injuries. We oh, were talking, interesting. Okay, Nick, okay. Nick and Jed were talking about this before. Uh, so both Nick and Jed have both had hip replacements. Both of they? them had their hips done, yeah. Uh, and they were saying it, it's, it's, they think it's to do with the Keon and static kicking. Yeah, they were Just talking about kicking static the air all hip the time. kicking from like a uh, Kibidachi... Or sorry, not keep it, Archie. From uh, no, from food of that, from just that, just static kicking. You know how we do that. Kicking a bag and going through it. Yeah, that that was well, their theory on it. I think they're onto something, and I think, uh, I think, because you're forcing do, your body to do something that's not natural. Yeah. So what we do is we that's that word what I was leading into. What we do and we do, um, Kihon is, in, you know. We often do our kicks from a, a close Hei Sokudachi sort of stance. Mm-hmm. But, but turning kicks, we literally, I'll tell the guys, you've got to turn your hips out. Yes, yeah. But I never mm. encourage everyone to stand like this because I don't think it's good for the body. But no. for kicks, you've got to try and turn your foot out so that when you do that turn, and there are certain kicks which we never do on jigsaw mats, namely Uchi Moashi and Soto Moashi. We never do them on jigsaw mats. Really? Uh-huh. Why? Why is that, Sean? Because I don't think it's good for the hips on a jigsaw mat, because your foot bites into the mat, so you're actually, you actually yeah. can feel that, that turn. I, I will say I I've mm-hmm. always trained on wooden floors, yeah. but the last the last five years where we are in my dojo is the tatami floor with a big canvas over it, so it's very grippy, and I found my body changing and. Oh and yeah. My hips have changed on it because 
when it say like in Zenko to Dachi, a, a fluid movement, I'm finding I have to manually lift my foot up and turn it to be able to step like back yeah, to the you old need to get basic it out of that way hole. of learning. Yeah. Yeah. It's just because it's so grippy that your foot won't naturally turn. Mm-hmm. And I'm finding this a lot that even when we're kicking Moashis, I'm telling people, no, you have to stick your heel out first and leave it there, then do the kicks. Otherwise, you're going to sm- mesh your knees up. Yep. Yeah, so the beauty of training on the beach is there's no reason yeah. to mm. do anything and, and your limbs are safer. You know, certain things that you can do in a couple of feet of water, it's even better, you know. Yeah. And now I have I go down to the pool and you, you can play around in the pool and it's like slow motion because of the water resistance. But mm. you're 100 percent safe with the joints. You know? George so St. Pierre. Yeah. George St. Pierre is a huge proponent of this. He posts a lot about this. He'll get into, into pools and go through his kicking, striking, all that stuff for exactly that reason. He's getting yeah. first. He's getting um, you know um, he's building because uh, there's resistance there in the water, obviously. Yeah. So he's building that. But there's resistance, but there's no it, resistance to the joint. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. He's a yeah, huge, is, huge proponent of that. There is resistance to the joint, but it's a healthy resistance. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, when you move, like right now, I'm rehabbing a shoulder, and they give you certain exercises. You do those exercises in the pool. Right. It's mm. actually really, really good resistance all the way through without it being dangerous, you know? And well, you can, no, yeah. there's, not, there's not like friction. There's resistance, but not friction. I, I have no money in this. I have no play in it at all. But George Sapier actually created these things. They're like these mitts to create more resistance for mm. when he's in the water. He does this stuff for exactly that reason. Gary so used to have me doing a lot of stuff in the pool when, when we were training for Japan. We'd go swimming once a week, swim a mile a week. And then we'd just be a chest height, just shadow boxing. Yeah. Just moving, doing, trying to get a leg up and out. Shion, I don't know how much time we have left with you, but there's something I got to ask you that's prob might be a little controversial. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, but, now but we take us two hours. Now we're getting into the deep, deep stuff. We have all. How much time? With, there's. Uh, I, I don't like to get into controversy. Okay, but, and it's not it's not too controversial. Problem, I promise, well, I, it's not too bad. If I'm comfortable answering it, I yeah. will. If I have an answer, if, if you don't know the answer, that's fine too, because you may not yeah. know the answer. But I've always been curious. So we've like back in the day. I mean, we've all seen the videos and and uh, images of Sosai doing pretty spectacular things. Whether it's you know taking a bull's horn off or taking the the top of a beer bottle and stuff. I need to know how legit was that stuff and how how much of it was um, theatrics? Was it pre-planned, like the maybe the horn cut a bit or the bottle prepared or whatever? Because, I, and before, like I know, like there was a very different time then. It's not like today where things that can be very easily researched and debunked or whatever. How legit was it? You've been quite sacralist there, Scott. I'm not. I'm just curious. <laughs> Curious uh, curiosity. Actually, I, I, I think your question is quite harmless. Yeah, thank you. If if it wasn't legit, then you'd be controversial. Mm-hmm. But because I'm uh, having spoken to people, because I'm a hundred percent certain it was legit, I don't think there's any controversy at all. I mean, awesome. the bottle cuts. You, you talk to Fleming Schroeter, Fleming. That's what Terry that. said, yeah. We had this conversation earlier. Yeah. And you look at the video that we put up. I put a video together with him when I was over mm. with him on YouTube. And the discussion that he had about that. And, the, and then I speak to a lot of people who trained really early on with Solsai. Mm-hmm. And they just shake their head. And, you know, the, the whole... See, there is one controversial thing which I won't really get into specifically. Mm-hmm. Why the notion that this could have been not legit was because of one of Solsai's top students who got thrown out of Kyokushin, so therefore started to change the story. Ah, uh, mm-hmm. okay. Uh, okay. There right the yeah. yeah. So he had a personal. Sure. 
Vendetta. And then his personal thing influenced another person that then also spoke out against Sorsai. Yeah. And the okay, people... That, that well, 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 we, we can say... Because we, we've sense. talked about this on the show before. We're yeah. talking about Kur, uh, Kurosaki. Mm-hmm. And then Kurosaki Perhaps. were... Well, no, that's that's what we're talking about. And then Kurosaki also influenced John Blumen because they yeah, worked yeah. W- worked a lot together. So there's a video out on the internet of of John Blumen saying that it's all fake, that this didn't happen. Kurosaki went to the abattoir the night before and he smashed the the. Well, we know it's not a we know it's not a Spanish fighting bull. We know <laughs> it's an we know it's an oxen style yeah. bull which Regular was a working bull. animal yeah. of that period in Japan. No one ever said it was a Spanish fighting bull, it, but it was a, a bull, this oxen, that Kurosaki went in the night, hit it with the hammer to loosen the horn, and then Sorsai snapped the horn off then in the demonstration. That's, Look, that's the story. I'm of the the ilk that even if that is true, and it was, like it makes sense if you're building up an organization <laughs> trying to be famous. But if it's real, that's even better, you know? Well, I mean, the point is, you know, you, how are you going to know? Get anyone else who minimizes Solsai and who makes claim that what he did was not legitimate. Go, okay, we've got this arena here, and there's a 500 kilogram ox over there. Show us. Away. That's going to do it. You know, I but mean, no one has in all the years. So, so uh, I, you know, you, well, Terry, so, you have a little bit. You, you, well, <laughs> smashed your own in the backyard. <laughs> oh, yeah, I brought, I've, I've seen now everything source I've done. I, I tried to, do, I haven't been able to do the bottle cut yet. Yeah, and I, I've just been to watch though. Lot, I speak a lot to Hanshi um, Fleming about mm. the bottle cut and stuff, and I, I just, I can't get it right yet. Um, but you, you were talking about the, the only people that have spoken out against source I really was Kurosawa. And and um, Kurosaki, uh, Kurosaki yeah. not Kurosaki, and then and then who influenced John Blumen? That's the own. They're the only ones that have spoken up against. And it wasn't when he was alive; it was a long time after he had died. So it was. Then you have to ask, as you just said, well, why? Why? Yeah. Well, I've spoken to a lot of people who trained with him in the Oyama Dojo days, who had no reason to try to minimize him and when they talk about him they say yeah look lots of people say this and that well maybe some people say this and that but no one had his speed no one had his explosiveness no one had his will and this is the thing it was his willpower that was head and shoulders above everything else Um, i've spoken to uh some people who talk about events that happen which are just insane mm-hmm. and so and it wasn't you know so wasn't a big man he was fighting at around 80 kilograms uh and the things that he did were driven first and foremost by his incredible willpower you know he would go and deal with one person or another that someone maybe they had uh had done something to bring a bad name to people or he just go and you know deal with that i I remember (laughs) reading a story sorry go on and i once um um soul size daughter was telling me about how at kindergarten they were doing kind of like a show and tell what did your dad do and someone got up and go well my dad's a public servant and my dad's a business man he's an office worker and my dad's a school teacher and she got up and said well my dad's a karate teacher and he fights bulls and bends 10 yen coins and they wouldn't believe her and the poor thing you know I, I feel for her because she must have spent an awful lot of time dealing with people saying you're lying because mm. she was about her father and he was just like, like a superhero yeah and so she said well if you don't believe me come home and i'll i'll show you introduce so you yeah <laughs> the hombu with eight of her little buddies from <laughs> said, yeah look see that's the horn and there's my dad that's a picture of him fighting the bull and that's one of the 10 yen coins he and these kids oh their eyeballs are falling out <laughs> and says hi papa and 
said, what is it? Well, I told them you bend 10 yen coins and they call me a liar. So can you bend them a 10 yen coin? And by this stage, he's probably, you know, in his 50s. And he goes, yeah. look, I can't bend 10 yen coins anymore. It's, my doctor won't allow me to even try. But I don't want them to call you a liar, so I'll bend them a 1 yen coin. And a 1 yen <laughs> coin is aluminium, right? So mm -hmm. for the average Joe, it's an impossible thing to bend. But for Solsai, the difference between a 10 yen coin and an aluminium coin is huge. So he gets a bunch of one yen coins and bends them all a one yen coin each and gives it to them. And, I, you know, when I think about it, I giggle because you imagine those kids go home and go, look, my friend's dad bent this for me. They go, no, no, no. He, he, put a, he would have. Yeah. Been a fight when you weren't watching. No, no, I saw him. <laughs> No, 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 no. So all of a sudden you've got eight liars now instead of just the one. And, you know, yeah. the, the, the thing was, the things he did were insanely beyond, you know, the famous story of him when he went and met that, the famous weight, uh, the bodybuilder in Japan who mm. broke all kinds of world records for his uh, strength um, stuff. And he rarely, if ever, accepted martial artists as students. I mean, he was the one who went to the Kodokan and said, um, what have I got to do to get my fifth down? He said, well, how, how long have you been training? I've never trained. But I heard if I beat a certain number, I can get my fifth down. <laughs> and that's kind of, you know. But he did go and the, he did fight these guys without any technique. And, so the, and he is the reason. Solsai said to me once that power is a legitimate martial art in itself if you know how to use it well. And I'd say it was that guy um, who encouraged him to think like that. Well, you know, he went along um, with, uh, with uh, Kimura to train with this guy. And, of course, he, the, he didn't want to accept them. So Solsai took a, an aluminium kettle, which in Japan, in winter, they all have these little stoves burning constantly in the rooms to keep the room warm and they always have a kettle sitting on top of it mm -hmm. it's also talked about the time the zen monk put his hand in the boiling water and left it in there for like 10 minutes whilst he's talking to Solsai saying you need to learn to soften up it's not hard 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 and that's when he said um you know that to the man with a powerful will even water, boiling water can seem cool. And the guy took his hand out and it was red but completely unaffected. And so that's when Sorsai learned to balance. And so um, Sorsai took that aluminium kettle, which was sitting there, but it wasn't hot because it wasn't winter, and ripped it in half. And the guy saw that and then accepted Solsai as his student, you know, and this is where Solsai learnt his weightlifting training and so on like that. So this wow. is why, Interesting. you know, John Blooming learned, he talks about having learned a lot of his stuff off his uh, friend in judo, who was, what was his name? The, the great judo fighter who wrote those beautiful books on the martial arts. Um, yeah. Um... Mifune? Not Mifune. No, no, no. Um, his name is a Westerner, American Yeah, guy. he's a Westerner. Yeah, uh, but anyway, um, uh, that's where John Blooming learned most of his weight training. But people don't realize that Solsai had learned his training off this incredible Japanese um, legend. I'm just going to look up his name. Yeah, I didn't know that either. I actually never, I thought I'm pretty versed in that stuff, but I never heard that. Yeah. His name is Wakaki Takemaru. Okay. He was... Yeah, he was like the uh, pioneer of weight training in Japan. Mm. Wow. You know, and, but um, you only got to look at Sorsai's physique, though, right? You look at his physique and you can see he is a powerfully built man and he does weight training. You can see that he does weight training. Oh, yeah, he's definitely. Yeah. I, which yeah. I, and I think today a lot of people doing karate, though, I, I call it the ancillary training. They're not doing the other training, the, the, the strength work weight training the push-ups the training to get your body strong to be able to do the karate because you need a certain amount of strength for karate to work for you 
Well, I know everything I've read about suicide, it was pretty adamant about strength training as an auxiliary Yeah, training. get strong. Get, like in the Ushideshis, like the and, guys and, said. And food. <laughs> he's like, eat, eat, get bigger, get bigger, get stronger, because weight is strength as well. Yeah. Fill out a bit. Yeah, I mean, and there's, there's a socialization to that too. And, you know, when people grew up through World War II and, 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 the incredible poverty and people dying of starvation and yeah. people not having food. So yes, good point. The same in India, you know, I mean, a, a, an almost obese, not quite obese, but a, a body that carries some extra weight is seen as desirable because it's hey. also a symbol of social acceptance as well. Terry, and you're so going to do well, buddy. This I, I know. I'm doing well at this stage <laughs> of my life. <laughs> also, you know, Solsai said that, um, and sometimes I can never remember whether he just said it in private or whether he said it publicly, but he said that uh, the, the most fearful experience he had when he was doing his mountain training wasn't the, the fear of the dark or the fear of the... It was the fear of hunger. And he wow. said... It, oh, not until someone experiences going to bed Hungry. knowing that you have nothing, you had nothing to eat, and you have nothing to eat when you wake up in the morning. He said that's mm. when fear really, really is a no different kidding. Time. No What's kidding. the um, there's an African proverb, isn't there? When, when the belly's empty, the mind is sharp. That's slightly different. That's like a lean, mean, fighting machine sort of approach. But Solsa yeah. is talking about. A different thing. He's talking about hunger. He's talking about when you have nothing to eat and you don't know where your next meal is going to come from, you become a little desperate. And yeah. so I think there's that socialization involved when Sorso says, eat, you know, eat more and more and more. You know, I remember you go to dinner with Sorso and he would, he, he loved guys to just eat and eat and eat, you know, and he okay. wouldn't judge whether it's time to end the meal based on whether everybody uh, has had enough to eat. He would judge it on whether there was any food left. And if there's food left, you would never leave it. Because it was based on scarcity. Yeah. That's right. It had to be eaten. Yeah. The question yeah. was, wasn't whether he he'd never say, have you had enough? Yeah. He would say, have you finished eating? Right. Big and difference. Was, yeah. And if there was mm. food there, he would ex ex accept. I mean, it was legendary that the uchi deshi would often excuse himself go out vomit and come back and keep eating oh yeah i mean terry uh, uh, yeah not yeah we make judgment on it but yeah. that's that's the psychology behind it you know yeah i mean judd and nick have both talked about that just like <laughs> jesus i can't eat anymore <laughs> mm. yeah and i remember once i was with saucy at a meal and i'm sitting with matsui and and uh i was just Full. I'd had enough, and my bowl of rice was still basically full, and it's, I can't eat another thing. It's like coming out my ears, and and so I very, as I'm talking and doing things, my hand would slip forward, and I'd push the bowl further yeah. and further underneath the lazy <laughs> in the middle of the table. Yeah. So it was kind of also, and it's like also I'd be looking at the bowls, and they're all empty, and he'd go. Okay, has everyone finished eating? Oh, us. Go, everyone finished? Oh, us. And Matsui went, Oh, so also, no, Cameron's still going. On <laughs> <laughs> oh, my rice out, you know. And, oh, <laughs> mm. Listen, I'm going to have can I, can I ask one more that I deem as controversial? Sure. And again, I'll leave it to you. There's been rumblings and rumors all over. And it's not just because of Sosa. It's the, um, I want to set this up properly because of the um, environment of that time and that, that a lot of things in Japan were controlled by Yakuza. So there's always been rumors and, and you know, side talk that, that Sosa was connected to the Yakuza as well. Is there any validity to that? Or is it one of those things where you can't, like, I have a friend in Japan who told me, a close friend who said, you can't really have an event in Japan, whether it's uh, anything, not just not any sporting, like any big event, you can't have it without Yakuza influence. 
So it could just be that, but I'm just wondering, was there any connection there to your knowledge? Yeah, yes and no. Um, you, you're really opening up a can of worms there because it is an <laughs> And I'm not, saying, I'm not saying right or wrong. It, it, right, no, it me is neither. Yeah. It is an area that the, the average Westerner has no comprehension of. Exactly, when, exactly. When, I, th when, I think if we lay the ground though as well, it, like when, when people hear Yakuza, they think like Italian mafia. It's not. It's not quite. It's not like that in Japan. The yakuza is very much part of the fabric of society than everything there. It's like a business. It's like a corporation. Well, and those families are descendant of samurai. Yeah. And yeah, yakuza, they, 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 are very, yakuza today are very different to what they were 50, 60 years ago. Exactly. There was a time yeah. where yakuza had a legitimate role in society, just the same as I think um, the early mafia and so on. Had, exactly. A role to play mm. in society yes but you know more to the point is that um uh in terms of soul size connection to yakuza look you got to remember when lbj went to japan i think it was about 1964 mm -hmm. just after john f kennedy was killed and, and lbj became the president in 63 he mm -hmm. toured he came to australia too i went and saw him and uh he the Japanese government presented their security plan and it was insufficient. They didn't have enough security guards. So Japan, the government actually used Yakuza for security. So the Yakuza actually lined the street. There's photos of it from Haneda airport into the Tokyo where they had security guards lining about every paramilitary. <laughs> Mm. about every 10 meters and they were all yakuza and it wasn't until years later that they found out that the u.s president was being protected by organized criminals and the america just went insane because they couldn't imagine how that could happen but right. in japanese mm -hmm. society it was perfectly legitimate because yeah. the yakuza also had a sense of honor for japan in fact right. probably the reasons why the yakuza continued in the way they did was they felt that, that that Yamato Damashi, that Japanese spirit of the samurai was being lost with the influence of Western mm. culture. That's why you had the Red well, Army. Thick. Yeah, yeah. Red Army terrorists in the 70s and so on. Mm -hmm. So, um, look, I think we're out of time because that discussion and soul size connection to Yakuza um, is a whole new story. I thought was so too. He, was he a Yakuza? No. Was he connected to them for an extremely short period until he had his own epiphany and realized that these guys were nothing but, but interesting, all minded criminals. Let's and park so he, that then for another conversation. That's awesome. Yeah. But there's a lot of discussion about that. Um, and uh, he had some very, very close friends out of respect who were one particular guy who also introduced me to who was a, um, um, a member of the Yakuza. Mm -hmm. um, but there are, you know, even the Yakuza, even good Yakuza will say that what the Yakuza, Yakuza became is very different to what it legitimately was designed to do. It's, so, it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's fish. changed a lot. I remember what I was watching a documentary on, on modern day Yakuza today, and it's almost now, it's almost illegal to be Yakuza in Japan now. You can't like open a bank account if you're affiliated with them. Um, in the onsens, there are certain you can't have tattoos showing if you're going into the onsens. They very much have become like the pariahs of society now. Uh, I, have I, minutes, I have three minutes to get dressed and go to training. Okay, right. well we'll um, we'll cut it there. Thank you for your time, Shian. Um, yeah, that was Thank you. Yeah, been a good conversation. And we'll, we'll, do a, we'll do a part two. Good on you. Yeah. Sorry about running out of time, but. No, no, no. Uh, we well, we've had much. A, and this is a good care for people. We came on early. <laughs> yeah, it's like over two yeah. hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, the, but this is why, this is why we, this is the nature of the show. There's no we just ramble. subject. We it just, just ramble. It just snakes wherever it goes. Yeah. So we'll, we'll definitely have, have a part two. We'll revisit it. Okay. Good on you. Thank you for your time, Shihan. I really, really appreciate it. Have an amazing class. Amazing day. All the best. 
You too. Of course, bye bye. See ya. All right. There we are. So we definitely will do a part two of that because then we go I hear where that one goes. <laughs> at the end we've got to i i think as what we have to uh keep in mind as well is sean cameron does know a lot of stuff and it's a lot of stuff that maybe he doesn't particularly want to speak publicly about 100 percent. that's why i was trying to tread as carefully as i could but yeah yeah, yeah. but it sounds like he's like open to speaking a bit, a little bit more yeah, about it, yeah. which is good because he's probably wants to be, I don't want to speak for him, but it sounds like he wants to be more on the side of like being clear about on the aid of caution. And, and, yeah. And what so size involvement was, whether the, you know, cause there yeah, are this, a lot of rumors and ridiculous rumors out there. There is, there is, this is, this is a good subject to talk about. And, yeah. and, like, and I've said this, I, I joke about this with Cameron all the time because we speak. I'm like, you need to tell people, you need to say these things because you are getting on. You, you know, with all due respect, <laughs> you're only going to be around another twenty odd years at the most. So, and when you go, all this stuff that you know goes with you. Yeah. So you need to you need to tell tell me, and I'll tell I'll say it. I don't care. Like- um, get it down into a book. Get it done. That was a fantastic conversation just now. I think it's a lot different than his usual ones where he talks about his history that he's been through a lot. And I think we're all quite aware of that. So it's nice to hear like all well, the stories about said. from the we're, Eric Paulson yeah. to talking to like trading with the Machado. Well, this, this, this is a side. This is a, this is a whole side that, that people don't know about. Yeah. Like she on Cameron has like, he, he's known obviously in the Kyokushin world for all his attributes there, but he, Cameron Quinn, she and Cameron Quinn is known in another part of the martial arts world where they, there's people who know she on Cameron Quinn that would be like, what's Kyokushin, which tells, puts amazing perspective. That's how much that he's respected in other yeah. realms of martial arts. Yeah. Um, he, he's, been, he's been around loads. I mean, do you remember um, footage or a YouTube video of a boxing match and there was biker gangs there and it yes. all kicked off and they throw, well, the referee of that fight was Cameron. Exactly. Exactly. He I've seen tons of referee in the fight. Pe- people are not uh, aware of some, like that's why I was bringing up Eric Paulson and stuff with Eric Paulson is like, you know, um, a legend in mixed martial arts started with yeah. Jit Kune Do and stuff. And Cameron has a great relationship with him and trained like significantly with him. And he's, people don't realize that out, he went out like, to Eric Paulson's gym to do a seminar. It's incredible. Yeah. It's incredible. Like a lot of these guys like that he's trained with. Um, and not to mention just like, I know there's such an incredible focus on him with his time with Sosai, but he, I just want to point out that he's so much more than that. And, and as for the Yakuza thing, like I, ha- I do have a close friend in Japan that has, had ties into that well well we 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 are going to do a show on that no we will but i just want people to know that like just when you hear the word yakuza and if somebody was uh, interacting with them it's not necessarily a bad thing it's it's sometimes like to my friend i don't want to mention his name that you can't escape it you literally can't escape it but this is what we said people people don't understand people think of it as the stuff they see in the films today it's it's nothing like that it's nothing it's not like that yeah, which is why he said almost the yakuza is almost like a, a corporation. The fam, but it's run like a corporation. This is a business. It's like yeah. a almost legitimate business. But if you don't do what we say, we will kill you. <laughs> but it's still a business. <laughs> yeah, there's actually I've been started watching a TV series that I can't recommend enough. Of course, the name is escaping me right now, so I need to sign in just to see what it is. But I think it's it's called Tokyo. Uh, ah, give me a second here. I've been watching. It's out of uh, Japan. It's in Japanese with. Uh, uh, What's it on Netflix? Is that? It's called. Yeah, uh, I don't know if it's on Netflix. It's HBO for sure. I use something called Flixster.to. Um, Flixster. And, yeah, it's a freebie. Anyway, search for for folks Tokyo Vice, and it's based on. Um, it's a true story. It's based on a true story of this journalist. I think it happened back in, um, I want to say the eighties. Um, a young man from the U S Midwest went to Japan and he became a journalist there and started working 
is one of the first, if not the first, Western journalists at the largest newspaper in Japan and worked on a story exposing the Yakuza and got involved with them. It's incredible. I, I, I highly, highly recommend this series. Again, Tokyo Vice. But it gives you a very different perspective of what Yakuza are and were and stuff. And even yeah. now, the evolution of it. Um, but like, uh, again, to my, my friend's point, like you can't have a tournament concert. No, you couldn't do anything. You can't do anything without involvement from those. But this is what I'm saying. That I watched a documentary on it and it was a, a, a Yakuza guy, a former Yakuza guy. And he was saying like, you know, I can't, I can't even open a bank account now because I'm associated sure, with that. Fair enough. Well, I know like, it, it, like my friend said, like there's certain, you made it up there when camera before camera got off because I was supposed to go to Japan before. And he was like certain places. He wasn't going to be able to take me because I have tattoos. Yeah. Uh, Japan's very serious about that. If you have a, a, exposing tattoos, it's associated with Yakuza. You won't well, when I, well, I said the onsen, onsen yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the bath, the bathhouse. Yeah, yeah. So you can't go there's in. certain bath you can't go in if you've no. got tattoos visible. Correct. I mean, even like my. Which are Viking not Yakuza, tattoos. obviously. Yeah. No, yeah. they're Viking, although I have got a massive dragon on my back and chest. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so European right. dragon. Well, we're European, not a real dragon. <laughs> Whoa, this is another show. <laughs> Just kidding. Just right. teasing. Let's that's, right. that's, that's round it off. So, yeah. guys, hope you enjoyed that episode. We will do I certainly two. did. Oh, my God. Yeah. We will do a part two on it. Uh, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, do all the things we need to do. And we'll see you in the comments. Cut. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.